How can Africa speed up its development? By speeding up its energy transformation. Despite Africa's great potential for clean energy, only a tiny fraction of the world's renewables is installed here. The African continent is growing faster than ever, and it simply can no longer afford more investments in the dirty and fragile economy of the past. Today, we're at a turning point. The recovery plans are the once in history push to radically change direction. We are here to make it happen. At Res for Africa, we stand for Africa. We believe in its huge potential. We believe in its innate energy. We believe in its growth. And we believe that all it needs is an enabling environment for its full development. At Res for Africa, we care for Africa. That's why we believe that clean energy is the only way to go. Because renewables mean more affordability. Because renewables mean more jobs. Because renewables mean more value. Because renewables mean more resilience, social justice, and health. At Res for Africa, we join for Africa, a unique blend of expertise along the whole value chain of renewables, joining forces to accelerate the transition to its sustainable and inclusive future. At Res for Africa, we innovate for Africa. We constantly look for new, improved energy solutions to provide not just clean and powerful electricity, but also cutting edge and reliable plants electrical grids that guarantee quality and stability through digitalization and storage. At Res for Africa, we act for Africa. We promote dialogue between governments and private players to define conscious, long-term policies, encouraging adequate investments. We share know-how with all stakeholders to promote the full development of Africa together. We train locals on the field to share our expertise and make them owners of their energy. And we never, ever stop looking for new and win-win business models made of African DNA. With a long-term green recovery strategy, we can finally build back better in Africa ensuring universal access to energy, making its economy more resilient, and leading the whole continent straight into a sustainable era. We are Res for Africa. Our mission is to build a better future through better energy. In Africa, with Africa, for Africa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us in this uh, new chapter of the uh, Rest for Africa journey. We, st we started as renewable only, as you can see, and now we move to grids and now we move to mobility. So maybe one day with Dino Marcotti, we'll do Rest for Mobility uh, with NLX and others. Uh, let me go quickly to a few slides to introduce why we are here. So I ask Fabio to put the slides on top. Now, the foundation has a, a traditional, original vintage program called Res for Med, which started in 2012. It's still today 
covers the cluster activities for the Mediterranean. Next slide shows you again the uh, company. We are becoming a more and more European wide intense uh, um, uh, group of uh, uh, investor, manufacturer, um, agency, uh, technical people all there in, um, in collaboration with the African and North African particularly uh, experts. We think we, we share perspective like today expertise uh, to the attention of our uh, African counterpart and we try always to add value of what we do. We don't want to solve the problem, we just want to propose options. Next slide shows also that we are now engaged uh, since many years in what I call the regional program, which uh, Ilaria is now the coordinator. And um, uh, we have uh, um, the logo you see there are the logo with, with whom we have a, a strong formal collaboration, particularly in Morocco, we have many of them, but also in other countries. And uh, we do have uh, activities ongoing in the whole area until Jordan there. So we are very proud to count on our counterpart there. And, uh, and uh, today we will hope to make this as a North African program. Next slide shows also you the um, publication, the analysis. Uh, let me mention to you the one on the left. We just released uh, uh, a survey 2020 assessing investment risk in renewable energy, which now is the update of the older study done below on the left on the 2016. I think this shows you the perception of a private sector players, uh, almost 200 of them, both from North Africa and from Europe, uh, to to make let's say an assessment of the what's missing or what is perceived. Uh, which is a barrier for investing there. But then you see all over there, I don't want to go in details, all the uh, publications which uh, describe uh, in a summary our work. Now, one feature of Red for Africa, you can download all of them from the website for free. There is no registration. We don't want to know who, who does it, not even password. Just go there and download in activities library what we do because we believe that the more people know what we do together with you the more the better so please take stock of the uh, website we have there www.redflux.org in the right up next one why we we well we think immobility matters in africa first of all but we try to summarize i'm sure the following distinguished speaker will uh, expand this issue First of all, immobility is well known for reducing the greenhouse gas emission and the more and more African country, particularly North Africa, are taking this seriously. Second one is we do believe that there is a job creation, a different kind of job, different kind of activities, but it is also beneficial. Renewable plus mobility can create more, more and more uh, jobs than just uh, fossil fuel production, that's, that's for sure. By the way, I want to announce you that in September, the Rest for Africa, together with IRENA and together with UNECA, will publish the flagship book on social impact and job creation of uh, um, energy transition, which uh, will also include mobility. Then, we, of course, we have to discuss the, the congestion cost. The traffic in the downtown uh, is becoming uh, as crazy as in Rome. <laughs> I'm from Rome. But uh, therefore, electrical, electrical transportation, particularly public transportation, metro underground, the trams may solve the issue. Finally, the mitigation also uh, uh, on a, a, in particularly uh, the non, uh, the national uh, 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 commitment the country have also immobility can contribute both to uh, the share renewable and most important, the share efficiency in end uses. And of course, scaling up renewable because we do believe the immobility, as much as green hydrogen, requires a much, much more bigger effort in terms of uh, renewable scalability. Because otherwise, we make a mistake and we do confuse uh, blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen. I think green hydrogen is the solution, medium long term, and the green mobility is also the solution for electricity, uh, feeding our car by coming from clean energy. Um, Next one shows, I think we are being close, the, why we started in North Africa. Well, the reason is the following. The Africa had the highest growth in transport fuel emission between the last 10, 10 years. 
and then uh, uh, you see the number there. And in North Africa, particularly in Morocco, started shifting to more environmentally friendly modes of transportation. And also in Morocco, Egypt, and Jordan, things that happen, you see on the bottom of these figures, the Morocco launched the first bike sharing system, then Tunisia launched the electric mobility in some cities, et cetera, et cetera. So we are, are eager to hear more from the, the in private sector and the association effort. And again, uh, um, to make sure this is not, is not only one single shot event, but becomes a program that we can share with the e models together. Next one is uh, just a, a recap of what we're doing. And uh, under, the, under the leadership of uh, Ilaria and Rima, we have uh, this uh, space called Med Platform, where we update you on uh, news, uh, news, weekly newsletter. We have uh, so many posts created. Uh, we have uh, shared the webinars. Uh, therefore, uh, please, uh, uh, we already can count on 435 profiles, which have a separate, let's say, uh, attention from us. Uh, therefore, uh, you can easily join them uh, into our website. And finally, I close with, uh, the, to remind you, next slide, the foundation um, uh, contacts. And I am clean. I'm glad to so to show you also the Med Program Coordinator Ilaria Urbani at Respiratory. So please uh, count on her for um, expanding and reinforcing our role. Now it's my pleasure to pass now the, the floor to Dino Marcozzi, who is the the the, the motor the engine of um, Emotus, the the association, the sister association. For e-mobility that we we really uh, glad to join together. Ilaria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Roberto, and thank you, Dino, for uh, for accepting to moderate this webinar. The floor is yours. Dino, can you hear us? Yes. No. That's okay. Yes. Perfect. Uh, fantastic. Okay. Okay, good morning to all the, the participants and uh, thanks to the uh, or, or organizers of, of, of this high up interesting uh, webinar, but especially thanks to Roberto Bigotti, who is, uh, as always, is an inexhaustible uh, explorer of new possibilities uh, in Africa, and especially now we are, we are talking about uh, North, North Africa. So I am uh, very, very happy to, to be here. But uh, let me start first with a little personal memory. Uh, until 2016, I, I worked in a, in a group. And in particular, my last uh, eight years assignment was to take care of the procurement of the uh, Anagrid power. Well, in this role, uh, I was able to lead the, the procurement uh, staff, the, the procurement team in the ne negotiation for the uh, uh, group of wind farms for 850 megawatts in uh, Morocco. I remember very well, I uh, traveled to, uh, to Hamburg to negotiate with, uh, with Siemens uh, first and the Siemens Gamesa after. So I, uh, to, today I feel, uh, I, I'm very, very happy, but uh, uh, I feel like a, a murder uh, returning to the uh, crime scene. <laughs> so, but for this uh, reason, uh, uh, I'm very happy to restart this uh, uh, this new uh, co cooperation with uh, with uh, with the uh, group. I have a couple of, of charts. Uh, if it's possible to share the first one, thank you. Okay, uh, this is a Motus E, or when we we call it the Motus E because Motus is a, a Latin name. And E stays E or e, e stays for electric in Italy. Motus means uh, Larry, I think Dino has a connection issue. 
Yes, I think that the Dino maybe has some pro technical problem. So um... I can, I can uh, do it, uh, Ilaria. Okay, Gra uh, thank you, Giovanni. Will... The floor is yours. Yes, can okay. Just a moment, my webcam. Okay, I am Giovanni Matranga. I'm a, a head of uh, uh, training and organization in Motusi, and I work with Dino. So I can <laughs> I can keep on with the presentation. Yes, these are this is our value chain uh, of Moto C. We have uh, lots of uh, uh, companies working uh, in the environment of uh, uh, immobility in Italy. Uh, we are grouped it uh, in uh, uh, four clusters: the automakers uh, in the first column, uh, but we have also uh, charging point operators, uh, all the companies working in the charge part of the of the immobility uh, with the service with uh, of charging and also uh, who builds uh, the infrastructures and components for automotive and uh, charging uh, infrastructure and uh, services because uh, the column of services uh, um, group uh, group uh, all the uh, all the services related to the uh, to the to the mobility uh, with, for example, uh, assurance. Uh, Dino, are you there? Yes. Okay. If you want to keep on, keep on going. Okay. Now you you can hear me. Yes, you can hear me. Okay, Giovanni. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, we were talking about this uh, scheme of uh, uh, associated companies that are in our uh, uh, organization. They are divided in vehicles, charging operators, services. Uh, I, I, I hear that uh, Giovanni was talking about this, and infrastructures. All these uh, uh, components are, are, uh, have the same rights to participate to our working groups. Uh, the next, please. Okay, together with the participant, we have a, a lot of partners in our organization because we wanted to cover all the value chain in the uh, immobility activity in Italy and, and uh, of course in Europe. So you can find here uh, the, 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 the main uh, academic organization like uh, the Polytechnics of Milan and Turin, Bocconi or Lewis. Uh, from, uh, from Rome. Then we have the research center like uh, RSE, ENEA, uh, C the CNR, the, which is the, the, uh, the main organization in, in Italy. Then we have the consumers. Uh, uh, we have the environmentalist organization like Le Egambiente or Kyoto Club or tra Transport Environment. This is very important for us because also the partner can participate to our working groups. Uh, please, the next one, and final. Okay, uh, this is our model. Okay, we have four main uh, um, working streams. Uh, the first is technology and market. The second one on the right side is environment. The ninth, the, the ninth is the industry and the education, and the tenth is the communication. All these uh, working groups uh, try to solve the problem, the challenge that are in front of us in Italy. When we started in 2018, there were a lot of, of problems uh, and the market was very, very tiny. But now the market is growing, growing very, very rapidly. I, I think that Giovanni will, will explain this after me. But it's important that all the participants can participate and, and create a positioning for our organization in order to, uh, to have a, a right uh, institutional relationship with the uh, policy maker in Italy. So we are a, a real uh, important lobby organization uh, in order to re represent the the total ecosystem of the uh, immobility. Looking at the, 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 the detail, you, we can see that in technology and market, we have a table for charging infrastructures. 
uh, this is very important because it try to uh, answer to the main issues that are uh, in uh, in a, a new or organization and it's very very important for us to to collect together in our organization 90 percent of our of our uh, operators and i think that the problem that we we will solve can be applied to the north africa the problem in the, in north africa of course is the uh, is that we want to change the paradigm because uh, one problem is the big or urbanization okay in north africa 78 percent of the people in the north africa lives in uh, in a urbanized uh, region uh, but in, in egypt is 93 uh, percent in libya is 81 1 percent so uh, this means that the pollution from one side and also the greenhouse effect uh, and second side are very important and it will be more and more important in Africa. So uh, it's important to, to change the paradigm to the immobility because immobility can solve both of, of this uh, problem. And charging infrastructures is one of the, the main uh, topics that we have. Then, of course, we have tariff and smart charging table and it, they study the the relationship with the uh, with the authority for energy in Italy in order to uh, uh, going better and better in the uh, in the scheme of tariff because of course uh, we have to, we have to pay to charge our cars uh, to charge our uh, small mo mobility uh, uh, devices but it's important to create an environment more friendly for the uh, for the users. Then we have LCAs batteries. The batteries is another big uh, important aspect in the immobility. E Don't forget that the, the batteries can be used also after we use them in a car, because after eight years in a car, the batteries are not so good for car, but still good for other uh, applications. So there is a second life in the, in the batteries, and we study this. Then we study for the market, okay, of course, and the fleets. The fleets are very, very important, especially the fleets in the public, uh, public administration, because if public administration change his fleet with new electric fleets, they can be a good example for the people and for the rest of the user. Another uh, very important uh, aspect is, of course, the local public tra transportation. And now the situation is that the buses can be electric, even if they are big, uh, with big weights, but they can be electric. And we have many, many examples of this in Italy. Of course, freight is, is another point. The, the transportation of goods and deliveries in the last mile will be covered from electric in order to avoid the pollution. And then going on the right side, of course, we study the local policies. Local policies means the restriction area, uh, the, um, for, for instance, is the study the restriction area and the policies of the local authorities, especially in the, in the cities, in order to facilitate the creation of this environment. Okay? Uh, another another table is the study of carbon uh, ne neutrality. For this reason, we are part of the European uh, platforms. Uh, two main platforms. One is uh, Avere, that is the, pla the main platform for the associators associations, and the other one is the electromobility platform for the uh, lobbying in the European Commission. Uh, and we are very active in these two uh, organisms uh, and, uh, and try to uh, put on, on it our point of view, of course. And then finally, we have other two tables. One is important because it's uh, industry and uh, education, because the change of paradigms involves a change in the skill. So we have to reskill uh, people and, uh, and companies, and we have to upskill also. 
So the 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 role of a, of education, a university, uh, the technical education in technical institute, technical high school in Italy, the aftermarket for the for the companies. Uh, these skills for the media, because the journalists sometimes are not so able to understand this new paradigm. And so this complex of, uh, of activities are managed by, by Giovanni, that I, I thank you because he is here and will manage all this web webinar. And finally, the last, the last table is the communication table, because communication is an important part, of course. It's a part of our, of, of our budget because uh, we have to organize events, uh, webinars, uh, participate to external we webinars in order to, to put together our ideas, uh, have relations with the media because we have to fight uh, uh, against the fake news, but we have also to do a, an advocacy role in our country in order to uh, create the new uh, civil, civilization, because have an electric car or an electric vehicle is a new civilization, because you have a different uh, relationship with your vehicle. It's not simply a vehicle that you charge and go, but it's a vehicle in which you can uh, plan uh, your travels and plan also your life because an electric vehicle can be charged when you do other things, also sleeping. I mean, but the way, when you are in an office, when you are uh, in a leisure uh, the place, or when we are doing, uh, you are doing shopping, for instance, electric vehicles it uh, can be charged. So it's totally change of your mindset when you start to do this. So uh, now the, my, my time is finished, so I, I leave the floor to Giovanni for the rest of, of the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dion. Okay. I, can, I don't see my slides. Sorry, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank, thank you. I'm Giovanni. I, <laughs> I'm um, uh, responsible for uh, training, education, and organization in Moto C. Uh, uh, now I will uh, speak. Uh, I will talk about uh, the mobility across the world. So the spread of electromobility uh, across the globe and uh, the perspective of barriers. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, talking about uh, what uh, Dino and Roberto said, uh, uh, the, the, theme of, uh, the theme of emissions uh, is very, very important for the spread of electromobility. As you can see in the, in the first part of the slide, uh, in uh, the banner uh, below why mobility, um, this is a... Uh, um, um, th th these are data from uh, uh, the US Zero Emission Transport Associ Transportation Association, ZITA. And they say that uh, uh, the 76% per of uh, um, less we, we, we have with electromobility uh, less uh, lifetime greenhouses for uh, minus 76%, uh, 67%, sorry. Uh, which is uh, the reduction of the um, average uh, air and uh, air pollution. And uh, this, this leads uh, so to many advantages, for example, an higher quality of life. And uh, uh, if uh, the demand of electricity uh, for, to charge an electro NAV uh, is supplied by uh, renewable energies, uh, this is uh, the top, the, um, because uh, we, we have uh, no uh, local emission. Um, and uh, there, is, there are also other advantages uh, in uh, the, the spread of electromobility. For example, if you have uh, an EV car, uh, you have uh, a, a saving on uh, fuel and maintenance uh, 
uh, annual fuel and maintenance. Uh, they calculate about an average uh, more than uh, one, um, uh, uh, one, uh, 11,000 uh, annual dollars of uh, advantages in savings. And uh, because it's, uh, in the, the EVs are, uh, uh, have lower maintenance costs, lower, of course, lower uh, fuel costs because they charge uh, with electricity. And uh, we have also uh, many advantages uh, for uh, regarding subsidies uh, from government. Uh, and also uh, there is a, a, a very important uh, um, advantage for the community, which is the optimization of the, for, the electric, for the electrical grids. Uh, to supply to, to support this uh, this uh, this demand. Uh, other boy, uh, and also uh, the the EVs are more efficient. There is no motorization, no uh, use of, uh, um, of, of on any traction. Um, uh, um, the 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 the, 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 the mobility is the more efficient uh, way. To uh, for traction uh, than, than any other solution, the efficiency the efficiency is more than seventy percent. Uh, with regards and uh, there is no no other solution uh, better um, uh, than uh, uh, than than mobility uh, electricity use for uh, for traction and also uh, we have uh, um, advantages in comfort because uh, if you have for example uh, a parking lot, a private parking lot or a private uh, garage, uh, you can charge it at home. Uh, you, can, you have no gears, uh, you have uh, more sp space uh, inside the vehicle because uh, we have uh, lo lots of components, lots of uh, uh, parts uh, are, are not present in the, in, the, in, the EV, in the EVs. And it's silent, more silent, and uh, suitable for autonomous driving. The, so the the digitalization and the autonomous autonomous driving is really connected, very connected with the, with the uh, the mobility, and also uh, yes, and uh, in the, by the by the survey of Zita, 96 percent of EV owners would buy another EV uh, an electric vehicle after. So and. Um, also, the cost of for uh, the cost for the community of care is very reduced uh, by the the less pollution uh, by the vehicles. So, e mobility is very very important. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, what's the situation uh, in the world's road? We have uh, more than eleven millions million vehicles, uh, electric uh, vehicles uh, all, over, all over the world. And we, we saw that uh, uh, in 2020, during the pandemic, uh, the sales of uh, uh, EVs, uh, the new, new vehicles registration, uh, was uh, more than 3 million in one year. And I, as you can see in the, in the, in the chart, uh, the, the uh, the uh, the um, um, rise is more than 43 percent versus 2019. So uh, the pandemic uh, and the, the 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 global uh, you have to think that the global uh, uh, um, the global uh, car market uh, all over the world uh, uh, made uh, minus uh, about minus 30 uh, uh, minus 20 percent of uh, sales. Uh, uh, so uh, it, uh, it is a uh, uh, the, the, the downturn versus 2019. 2019 was minus 16 of the of the total market. So uh, EVs grows despite the immobility. And we expect uh, uh, e, e, this is uh, from uh, these are data from uh, EEA uh, Global EV Outlook. Uh, we expect uh, by uh, 2030. Um, um, about uh, uh, 150, uh, 150, 20, 30 millions uh, EVs uh, in the stock, uh, circulating stock. So about uh, the 7, 20, uh, 12 percent of the total stock is uh, will be uh, EVs. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. 
another very, very surprising effect of the pandemic, uh, show, shown by the pandemic, is that uh, Europe overtook for the first time China as the world's uh, uh, lar the, as the largest electric vehicle market for the fir very first time. Uh, so in Europe, we we sold more uh, EVs than China for the first time, and Germany, Germany now is the second market after China. Uh, in the previous year, in 2019. Uh, the second market was US. So now US in the, is in the third uh, position. So Europe is working a lot in uh, in the uh, building, uh, in the building of the EVs, uh, in the building of batteries, and and uh, this is improving uh, uh, despite the pandemic. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. An important role uh, uh, during this pandemic uh, for in bo in boosting EV, EV sales uh, is the, um, are, the, are the subsidies, because of course uh, uh, subsidies are necessary to spur uh, the initial, the very initial uh, uptake of, uh, just a second, Okay, to spur the initial uptake of uh, EVs and uh, to underpin the, um, the scale up of uh, immobility, EVs manufacturing and sustainable batteries in the industry. It's so the subsidies in, in the first time, in the first years of the of the of the EVs of the EVs spread is very very are very very important. But these uh, these subsidies can be gradually uh, reduced uh, or phasing out uh, when uh, when the, the sales expands so the sales expand so uh, many uh, many many countries uh, in europe uh, has declared and uh, put the uh, many many um, subsidies or initiatives uh, incentives uh, for example incentives in uh, a discount on the in the in the in buying a new car a new a new EV. Um, or, for example, no uh, BIT uh, on BEVs, for example. BEV, you have to distinguish between BEV and FEV. BEV are the 100% electric car. FEV are the hybrid, so they have uh, also not only a plug-in, uh, um, they are not only plug-in, so uh, fu fueled by electric uh, electricity, but also with a, um, a parallel uh, uh, motor parallel power train of uh, in uh, internal combustion uh, in internal combustion engine. Uh, also, other, other many many countries uh, as uh, done as Italy uh, bonus malus. So it's um, a totally self finance system in which uh, the 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 more the less uh, the less uh, polluting car uh, have the have the um any disincentive and the disincentive is paid by the more polluting cars so uh it the all the system is uh, totally uh, in uh, equilibrium um okay so uh, it's very important for example for emerging countries uh, to improve a system of subsidy in the first uh, uh, in the first uptake of uh, EVs thank you next slide Okay, uh, in Europe also uh, many countries are, are talking about uh, declaring phase-out. Phase out. What is a phase-out? Phase-out uh, is the ban of, a new, uh, the, of the sales of a new um, internal combustion engine conventional vehicle uh, by a certain uh, period, a certain year. Uh, so, for example, as you can see in the chart, uh, um, Norway is the first one uh, banning the the EVs. Uh, Norway is uh, uh, Nor in, in Norway sales of uh, uh, BEV are the majority of the total market. So 
they are uh, in a, as Ebisa, the, the, last, the last data. Uh, in the last data, we, we saw that uh, Ebisa were more than 70% uh, of the total sales of cars in uh, Norway. So they are very, um, uh, they are a, 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 a beautiful example of uh, uh, improving uh, this uh, system of uh, subsidies, uh, but of course, uh, creating a culture of uh, immobility. Um, so they are uh, they are the first uh, the first uh, the first country uh, declaring it and also uh, banning the, the the new ICE. Uh, in 2030, we see more 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 countries. Uh, 2013, uh, uh, United Kingdom that uh, are discussing to uh, anticipate uh, this uh, dat this uh, data. And of course, uh, France and uh, Spain in 2014. But not only not only countries. Uh, are declaring a ban on uh, this this phase out, uh, but also automaki automakers, uh, automakers that are banning uh, this uh, new IC sale new IC sales in Europe. As you can see in the in the bottom part of the of the of the chart, uh, many of them are declaring. Uh, for example, uh, many are uh, are uh, not investing uh, uh, are investing no more in. Uh, ICE improvement and receive ICE investment, or we are we declare phase out uh, or net zero target. The, 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 so uh, net zero target means uh, that uh, their vehicles uh, doesn't have any emission, so zero, totally zero. It's important message for the countries, the growing economies uh, is is to jump, as as said by the uh, uh, is to jump. They can jump, you can jump uh, the fossil era, preventing billions of tons of uh, uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. Be because uh, uh, in investment can, can go this way. So, for example, um, um, you, can, you, can you are de de developing a renewable energy environment. And uh, uh, immobility dis dis diffusion can, can go, can be. A uh, second step can be a, um, a natural consequence uh, of the spread of a new renewable energy because uh, it makes uh, uh, producing electricity uh, more economical. So you can you can uh, uh, you can reduce your your uh, your emission uh, uh, combining the two systems. So it's very very important. And North Africa could drive this change of paradigm in all the continent. So it's very very important uh, to set uh, objectives like this. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let's talk about barriers. Um, EV uh, 100 members, which is uh, um, which is a uh, uh, an organization um, um, done by uh, Climate Group. The 100 members are the the the, the um, a universe of companies uh, um, by uh, grouped by uh, the climate the climate group, uh, and they uh, asked to the to these companies uh, what are the top of, the top five barriers barriers to the EV adoption because. Uh, of course, we talk about uh, private uh, passenger car in immobility, which are in, the, in this moment uh, the majority of the market. Uh, but also, we, we uh, the, for the for the, electrific the electrification of the fleet of the companies uh, is a very important thing. And um, they asked to these uh, these companies, uh, um, uh, which are in 80 market different market, co and are committed to making. Uh, to making EV transport uh, the new normal, the new normal by 2030. Um, they are switching their fleets, of course, to to EVs. They are uh, expanding the availability of uh, charging infrastructure for uh, for the customers and also for uh, for the their their staff. And uh, uh, they are uh, halving. Um, they are more than than a half. Uh, 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 of electricity to power their charging infrastructure uh, are made uh, is made by uh, renewable energy. So uh, the top one uh, hurdle uh, of uh, the adoption is the lack of charging. So they feel that uh, um, finding uh, uh, it's it's hard to find. Uh, they have a kind of uh, 
uh, um, a kind of uh, anxiety on uh, on uh, on uh, the, 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 the to find the charging infrastructure uh, in, uh, in the streets. So this is uh, the first one uh, perceived uh, problem. Another one is the range, range anxiety. So the lack of appropriate uh, EV type, for example, to how many kilometers my my EV uh, can uh, can drive uh, with a charge. And another one is uh, the, the high purchase price, the capital cost of EVs. Uh, these are the top buyers. So let's go. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Oh, let's talk about uh, charging points. Uh, the charging points in all over the, the world are 100, uh, 1.3 million in 2020. And this, this means, uh, this, this means uh, sevenfold the last uh, five years. And now at the moment, uh, China has the, the majority of uh, this, uh, of this uh, charging infrastructure. But the problem of charging infrastructure and of course of the barrier of lack of charging is that the charging infrastructure are often installed, installed where it is possible to install, not where it is needed. So this is the, the, the first, uh, the, the, the top problem of charging, installing a charging infrastructure. And uh, these charging infrastructure are expected to, to grow to, seven, uh, um, to 60, 24 million uh, at uh, uh, 2030. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, another another thing is uh, the uh, regarding the the capital cost uh, of uh, EV and also the range anxiety is the battery, battery price, pa the battery pack prices, and energy density are supporting uh, the the rise of uh, in EV uh, sales. As you can see in the first uh, in the first um, in the first uh, chart, the the um, uh, the, the 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 price of the of the battery of the lithium lithium ion batteries are dropping uh, uh, dropped from uh, 2000, 2010 uh, uh, to 2020 uh, 89% uh, and uh, uh, there is a learning rate of uh, minus uh, 18% which will lead to future future uh, future dropping of the of the curve you can see in the curve that it is the price is, is dropping and also uh, the battery pack energy density is growing which means that a parity um, at uh, Ceteris paribus at uh, a megawatt hour per kilos so the, the average energy density is rising so uh, with the same uh, uh, weight of the battery you have more kilowatt hours inside or watt hours inside you can support a more perform a great performance and an improving of the performances of the vehicle and this is it is it is dropping also the total cost of the battery so uh, next slide i'm going uh, I'm going faster uh, yes the decrease of battery prices and of course the the improving of the performances of the battery is leading to uh, an, a, 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 rich, a, a, a price parity with ICEs, uh, the conventional uh, vehicles, uh, in all the segments. And uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, this is uh, uh, expected uh, uh, between 2025, for, for example, light bands, to 2027, which, is, uh, which are the sub, uh, um, the sub uh, of segment B. Uh, so it, it is making the decrease of battery price is making also the EVs more affordable and comparable to ICE. Next slide. Maybe it's, it's the the last one. Okay. Uh, in uh, uh, automakers are are uh, are spreading the models, the menu of EVs uh, mod, EV models uh, um, at disposition of the of the customers. Uh, and this, uh, this is increasing the competition among automakers. This is leading also in uh, technology advancements, energy density improving of the batteries. And now, uh, as you can see in the yellow, in the yellow, um, in the yellow squares, uh, now the, the, the average nominal range of, of beds 
of uh, electric vehicle, uh, 100% electric vehicles, is about uh, 35, uh, 30, uh, for, for, uh, 350 kilometers. So with a charge, you can drive nominally uh, uh, about uh, 350 kilometers. You, as you can see in uh, Italy, the average daily driven, uh, the average the average kilometer kilometers driven by uh, any any uh, in average is uh, 42. So you can uh, it, the, the range anxiety is uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, is, uh, is uh, okay is uh, um, uh, is uh, it's okay only if you do uh, very long uh, long uh, very long uh, drives. So. Uh, travels uh, and and so on, but if you in the in the daily life in the daily uh, in the daily life uh, uh, your car can support your uh, in one charge, so uh, you can you can drive uh, all the day, of course uh, more days in the week. So uh, it's a it is a, uh, due to the use of the of the car or the use of the vehicle you do. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, this is uh, a very, a very good, uh, a very important response. So, next slide. Okay, this is the last one. So, thank you for the attention, and I'm here at your. Uh, if you have a question um, of uh, my my presentation in my presentation, thank you. Thank you, Wim. Thank you, Giovanni. We can't hear you, Wim. Okay. Yes. Good. Perfect. Okay. I introduce I introduce Wim. Uh, I introduce Wim. Uh, the um, um, uh, sales. Uh, um, he works in sales of emerging uh, uh, markets region at the mobility division at global level in uh, ABB. So, Wim, thank you for. Uh, uh, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome to you all. Uh, it's an honor for me to do this presentation. I would have uh, preferred to do this right in front of you on the stage with a microphone. But today I'm doing this out of uh, beautiful but rainy Eindhoven in the Netherlands to, uh, to talk to you about the past, uh, the present and the future of uh, high power charging. Um, and uh, it'll take me around 15 minutes and then uh, in, at the end of this conference there will be a Q&A. So if you have any further questions, please feel free to uh, keep them with you and share them at the end, end of this conference. All right, next slide please. Yeah, as ABB, uh, we are the global market leader in, uh, in DC fast charging. And we are working with almost all global companies involved in e-mobility at the moment. So if we go from west to east on this slide, uh, EVgo and Electrify America, two major, major charge point operators in the USA, uh, providing uh, e-mobility services to the um, to the market there, but also in uh, in Latin America, where there is uh, both the oil and gas companies as well as um, the utilities who have set up the charging services in Latin America, and then of course in uh, in Europe, you see a mix of companies providing these services. It is the pioneering companies who have started with investing in DC fast charging services a long time ago, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and then you see uh, utilities um, coming to the market, providing these services as well. And these days, what we see is that there's a fast uh, takeoff and investment being done by the car OEMs uh, and sometimes in a corporation and sometimes not in cooperation with the oil and gas companies. But the oil and gas companies are also an important um, stakeholder at the moment in this market. If we look at the market in uh, Middle East and Africa, uh, and I'll show you a few uh, references later on, 
that's where we are also very active uh, at the moment. We have our charges installed in the whole of the, uh, I can say, the, uh, middle, uh, the, the uh, Saudi Peninsula and in Northern Africa as well. Uh, again, more details later on. And then uh, very important, of course, to have the engagement with the Chinese uh, car OEMs as well. We've just heard that they've been uh, that the market there is uh, overtaken now by the European market when you look at the volume. But of course, the uh, Chinese market is a pioneering market when you look at it from uh, from an e-mobility uh, perspective, both from the vehicle side as well as from the charger side. And then if we go down to uh, to uh, Southeast Asia and uh, Australia, New Zealand, that is where we have a um, a significant market share as well. But if we look at the next slide, and if we go to the next slide, I'm happy to share with you uh, a few examples, proud examples, I should say, of the installed base that we have in, in Middle East and in Africa. Uh, whereas in Saudi, we have now installed our first charges uh, to, to charge the, uh, the beginning of the e-mobility market there. Uh, Jordan, uh, I don't know if anybody from Jordan is in this call. But if you've been there, um, there's, there's more electric vehicles on the roads in Jordan. And it's, it's, it's strange if I look at the stats that, that, that we always share in, in these kind of conferences. Uh, it's, always refer, it's always referring to uh, Norway, uh, Netherlands sometimes, Germany. But if you go to Jordan, you don't know what you see. The, uh, the, uh, the, the cars on the road in Jordan is tremendous. Uh, uh, unfortunately, there's still a lack of uh, charges installed in Jordan, but we are happy to, uh, that we are uh, one of the suppliers to, uh, to Manasir in, uh, in Jordan. Then we have our uh, charges installed in Morocco as well uh, and in, uh, in UAE, uh, where we have uh, a close partnership with the uh, authorities as well as with Porsche. So together with Porsche, we are um, uh, rolling out the infrastructure for charging the Porsche Taycan in, uh, in Middle East and Africa as well. First charges are installed in Rwanda as well, which is a, a country where I expect uh, a fast uh, evolution uh, of the uh, of the e-mobility market. So um, uh, it'll be happening there absolutely. And then of course there's uh, there's Egypt where we have our charging installed as well. So besides of this whole global installed base that we have, I'm very proud to share with you these references that we have in Middle East Africa as well. Next slide, please. And let's have a close look because that is uh, besides of these uh, good stories about ABB and how successful we have been. I think it's also important to share with you a little bit on um, the past and then where, where are we today and where will, will we go in the future. So when the electric vehicles came to the market uh, 11, 12 years ago now, the first uh, vehicles that were coming to the market uh, were the, uh, the vehicles in Japan, uh, the uh, Nissan the Nissan Leaf and the Mitsubishi IMEF, they came to the market and they could charge at 50 uh, kilowatts. If I translate 50 kilowatts to uh, a charging speed per, uh, per minute, 50 kilowatts, you could charge those days your, your battery in half an hour uh, uh, and then uh, the battery was full. Um, the, the, the Western car manufacturers also wanted to develop electric vehicles, took them a little bit longer to introduce their, mark, their uh, vehicles to the market. They came to the market in 2013, but instead of the Shadamo standard that was being used by the uh, Japanese vehicles, they brought uh, at the same capacity, 50 kilowatt, they brought the CCS standard to the market, which is today the international accepted uh, um, uh, standard for charging electric vehicles. We see that the Japanese, uh, are uh, very much focused on still supplying uh, the, uh, the vehicles to the Japanese market with the Shadamo, but we do see now with the new Nissan, uh, com new electric Nissan coming to the market, that they will be using CCS2 as well, or at least CCS, I should say, uh, for the cars that they supply outside of, uh, of Japan. So that was 2010, 2013, uh, and extremely proud, of course, on, on what we could do. Eh? We could charge a car in, uh, in 30 minutes, and it could go uh, 150 kilometers. Uh, so that was, uh, that was quite something. Um, 
But then, uh, of course, uh, the, the new types of vehicles came to the market. The, the, the first vehicles then coming to the market were electric buses. Electric buses that could charge at 150 kilowatts. Uh, we uh, do not use a connector for that. Those days we were not using a connector for that, but we were using a pantograph that could, uh, that could connect to the infrastructure or to the bus. Um, and then you could charge these vehicles at 150 kilowatts. If, if somebody would have told us back in 2010 that in 2016 we would be charging vehicles at 150 kilowatts, we would have told them they were crazy, but it absolutely happened. And what then happened actually was the luxury vehicles came to the market. Um, the first real luxury vehicle coming to the market was the, the Tesla uh, Model uh, S, of course, which had their own proprietary charging standard. And then the first vehicle using international standards was the, uh, the Audi, the Audi e-tron, that could charge at a speed of 150 kilowatt, as fast as these buses as well, but uh, then using a connector. And, and soon after that, uh, Porsche introduced that Taycan, who potentially could even go up to 350 kilowatt of charging. Um, and, and you have to imagine this all happened within a time period of seven years, uh, which is uh, a tremendous pace of a development that took place. Now, so that is the standard where we are today. So buses are being charged with pantographs at 150, or I should say heavy vehicles are being charged uh, with a capacity of modular 150 kilowatt. So these vehicles can be charged at 150 kilowatt, uh, 300 kilowatt, some even at 450 kilowatt. And with an exception of 600 kilowatt, we have seen though, there seems to be a mismatch with the, uh, uh, with the operational uh, requirements for the 600 kilowatt. So 450 for heavy vehicles, and we have a maximum currently uh, offered to us by the CCS standard of 350 kilowatt. Now, what is coming at us is, uh, of course, we have the first electric trucks on the market as well uh, these days, but these are the, uh, the, 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 the short haul delivery trucks that go from a distribution center into a city center to supply the local shops, the local restaurants, etc. What we are now looking at is introducing of the semi trucks that will do long haul. Uh, that will take uh, that that will be able to do a thousand to a 1500 kilometers and that those uh, those trucks need to be charged as well and that is where we are currently looking at the, the megawatt uh, charging standard so uh, that is where we will be able to supply more than a hundred uh, sorry more than a megawatt of charging capacity uh, to these vehicles and if you then look at the uh, so that is the, the future that we're looking at. Megawatt charging is the future, where we need to be able to supply more than a megawatt to the semi-trucks visiting charging stations uh, as well. And if we then go to the next slide, we can see that there is an involvement of ABB at, the, at all stages. So right at the beginning, we've been involved with the Japanese uh, car makers to work on that uh, Shadamo standard. And actually, that was also the moment that uh, ABB started to, uh, to be interested in, uh, in, in this uh, market of, uh, of e-mobility DC fast chargers. And that is uh, back in 2010, when we brought our first uh, DC fast charger to the market. And I won't talk, take you through this whole slide, mm -hmm. but what you've seen is that ABB has always been involved with defining the next steps in the standards uh, that, uh, that uh, have to be applied for, um, uh, for EV uh, fast charging. In fact, ABB was involved and is involved in, uh, in fact, defining the uh, technology for fast charging of vehicles. That can also be seen if we look then at the next uh, slide. Um, the next slide is uh, explaining a little bit on the product portfolio that you should take into account, eh? because you could, of course, charge up to a megawatt, but what charge do you actually need at your site. And that is what we have split in uh, three, four different uh, segments. So here you see the first segment, and that is where you see the need of charging your vehicle within a longer time. Uh, so uh, up to a maximum of 50 kilowatts. Uh, we can supply that with, uh, oh, this is what we call the destination charges. Um, so we have the wall boxes, the wall boxes that can charge at 11, or 24 kilowatts. 
and that can be installed at households as well. The future, the future of uh, uh, the future of the uh, um, of charging will be DC uh, charging, as what we see is that most of the modern buildings that will be built may go completely to DC. Uh, look at the uh, look at the quantity of of converters uh, that we currently have in our household already. Yeah, the AC DC converters that I'm currently using here with my laptop to do this presentation for you. Why not having a DC grid in my house? But secondly, we will see that the car manufacturers who are currently doing the conversion in their vehicle, so we give them AC uh, from, uh, from an AC wall box, and that will be converted inside the vehicle from AC to DC to charge the vehicle. We will see that these uh, AC to DC converters will be taken out of the vehicles and that all, the only option left is uh, DC charging. Now here you see two DC wall boxes, one is at 24 kilowatt, one is at 11 kilowatt, and they are capable of vehicle to grid as well. That means that if you're charging your vehicle at home, or let's say when you connect your vehicle at home, you can still, you can still use the remaining power that's left in the battery to, uh, to, to, to provide that energy to your household. And when the, your car needs to be charged, uh, and when the electricity and the capacity is uh, available from your electrical installation back home, you then start charging your vehicle. So vehicle to grid uh, possible with these uh, chargers at, uh, at destinations, at home and office locations. And then there is the 50 kilowatt charger, a charger that can charge your, uh, your car. Uh, these days, the battery sizes are going uh, up to 90 to 100 kilowatt hours. Uh, but these uh, these uh, ch these charges can uh, charge your vehicles at a destination where you spend a longer period in one to two hours. Next one, please. Now that can also be um, uh, um, that can also be um, situations where you would like to charge your uh, your vehicle as fast as possible, um, uh, in, uh, so to say, a highway environment, for example, and that is where you can then charge your vehicles. Uh, with 180 kilowatt, and if your vehicle uh, allows even up to a 350 kilowatt, which is currently the maximum in the charging uh, in, uh, that CCS uh, allows. Uh, and that means if your battery capacity is 100 kilowatt hours, that with charging uh, at 180 kilowatt, you will be charging around uh, half an hour, a bit more than half an hour. And with the 350 kilowatt charger, well, you can do the math yourself. So also depending on, um, on, of course, the battery management system in the vehicle, but you can charge your, bat uh, your battery in 10 to 15 minutes. So this is what, what's available today on the market. Um, and um, what I would like to share with you is a little bit on, on the, where the future will go. So if you go to the next slide, please. Um, that is where you will see that, that much of the installations and much of the power conversion that's being done today is uh, being done uh, on a decentral level. So every charger that you see on the left side of this uh, of this slide are using their own AC to DC uh, conversion. Um, what is and and then of course uh, that you, you can use that power to the maximum or not. And when it's not used to the maximum, it is sitting there doing nothing. Uh, so what is what is a more efficient way of doing this is to have a centralized uh, a power conversion where you do the AC to DC conversion. And that you then distribute that to uh, to the chargers on the charging station, and you let every dispenser only use what is being requested by the vehicle. So then, at least you have the full capacity centrally available, and you can feed the dispenser with the uh, with the capacity that is requested by the vehicle. Uh, an efficient way of uh, distributing the energy over a site and to consume the power that's centrally available in a central power cabinet. Now, how does this look in the field? One more I would like to take you through on where we, are, where we, where we were, where we are today, and where we are going in the future. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is what we call a charging uh, 1.0. This is where most emerging markets start. So this could well be the case for, for Northern Africa to apply. This is where we install charges to the grid, and uh, these charges can charge at a 50 kilowatt, 180 kilowatt, uh, 350 uh, kilowatt, depending on uh, the need of the customer that is visiting these locations. 
if you install it at the fast food restaurant, you can spend an hour in the fast food restaurant. If you have a highway charging station, of course, you want to spend as little time as possible over there. So this is really charging uh, uh, and connecting a charger to the grid. And this is where it all starts. And this is where it also all started in, in Europe. Then where we are in Europe today, if you look at first, so that's the next slide. If you look at charging 2.0, that is where we now have a lot of chargers coming to sites and where we see there, that there is a limitation in local grid uh, availability and local grid capacity. Um, so that is where we then add batteries uh, and battery energy storage to these locations as well. It has two advantages. Um, the, uh, the battery, of course, can uh, increase the available uh, grid, grid capacity or capacity available on the site if there's a limitation uh, from the grid. And it can also help you with the peak shaving. And in some countries, the, uh, uh, the cost for, uh, for the grid are very much depending on the peak being consumed. So if you use battery energy storage on the location, you can also reduce the, uh, the peak that you consume. So that has a, ser a serious impact on your operational cost. So this is charging 2.0. And this is what we are doing today in Europe. And a nice reference is shown on the next uh, slide. For those of you uh, who follow uh, the socials and who follow what's going on uh, in, in the world, this is one of the most modern um, charging stations that has recently been commissioned and opened in the UK. This is GridSurf, and GridSurf has installed um, a tremendous number of chargers uh, on this location, and I believe they have installed a full megawatt uh, hour uh, battery energy storage there to store the energy that is being charged by the grid as well as by the solar, solar panels over there and that then is managing uh, the peak demand uh, on, uh, on, uh, on this uh, site. So good reference and that's where we are today. Now uh, please allow me also to share my last slide with you and that is on, on where we will go then in the future. Next slide please. Yeah, next one. Yeah, thank you. And this is then this is then what I just discussed. This is charging uh, 3.0. Um, this is where we will no longer have uh, uh, a, a decentralized power conversion, but where we will have a centralized huge container or containers or e-houses, if you would like to call it like that, uh, that do that that power conversion centrally on the location. And then distribute that to the uh, to the uh, charges on the site, or that uh, th that will uh, charge the battery when there's no cars charging on the site. Uh, and then, of course, you will use a DC uh, DC grid to distribute that energy on the site. Extremely efficient, as I previously uh, discussed. But this will still have a local uh, power management. This is where we are now going to. Uh, this, uh, this will happen in, uh, in the coming uh, months and years to come. And eventually we will then evolve to charging 4.0. So that's the next slide, please. And the next slide is same setup, uh, same setup. But what we will then have is we will have central power management. So from a central location, the digitization will absolutely uh, play an important role in the further uptake of the, uh, the management of, uh, of the loads and the energy being consumed on the site. So there will be central power management um, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for, the, for, for, for the for the centralized uh, power conversion. And what we will also see is that uh, the vehicle to grid will also play an important role here not only from the battery uh, that is on site, but also from the, uh, from the vehicles that uh, potentially could do vehicle to grid uh, support, vehicle to grid as well. Of course, there's always the use case eh, for vehicle to grid. You, uh, the, the ideal use case is to do that on a location where you spend a longer period at home or at the office. But what we do see is from some markets and from some use cases, is that we do absolutely see the requirement to support vehicle to grid uh, as well uh, on, uh, on highway charging locations. So uh, version 1.0 is where we were, uh, 2.0 is where we are today, and 3.0, 4.0 
is where the market is evolving to in the near near future. Next slide, please. And that leaves me with then with thanking you very much for your attention. And I'll be here during the Q&A at the end of this conference for further information on what I presented here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bim. Uh, the, um, the the important uh, the important of this the importance of the storage uh, integrated to a charging infrastructure is very very important. In fact, in the and the peak sharing also uh, very very interesting. This uh, slide of the future of the charging infrastructure. And I would uh, I would uh, ask you to if you can send me the this presentation because it's very very interesting. Thank you, Wim. And also ABB, I want to. To remember that ABB is one of the uh, is associated with uh, with uh, Motus C. So uh, yes, uh, thank you, thank you for everything. Thank you, Giovanni. Yes, I think the presentation will be made available by uh, by the organization. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next uh, relator we have uh, uh, Amel Chadli. Chadli, okay. Uh, yes. uh, Vice President, uh, Strategy and Digital Energy for Middle East and Africa at Schneider Electric. Thank you, Amel. I leave you the floor. Thank, thank you, Giovanni. I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, so uh, I want also to thank Res for Africa to give us this opportunity uh, to be with you. Uh, so uh, I am Amel Shelley. If you can go to the next slide, please. I am Amel Shadli and uh, I'm in charge of, uh, yes, thank you, of uh, the business unit of digital energy and the strategy for Middle East and Africa. I'm very pleased to be with my colleague Elias Miles, who is leading the uh, business intelligence for Middle East and Africa for Schneider Electric. So just a few words about Schneider Electric. We are the uh, global leader in energy management and uh, industrial automation. So our purpose is to make the most of our energy to all uh, in order to bridge the uh, sustainability with the progress. Uh, we are calling this life is on. So our primary mission is to be the digital partner for uh, the uh, sustainability and the efficiency. As the um, the global transport emission represents 23% of uh, the CO2. It's very common that Schneider Electric uh, in, has a part of his uh, global strategy, uh, the e-mobility. So we are very happy to, uh, to share with you today our vision about the electrical vehicles. We will start by uh, just giving uh, very quickly a view about the transition of the, uh, the grid and which transformation we have in the energy landscape. Then we'll go to the, uh, uh, to the uh, ecosystem of electrical vehicles and we'll be more focusing on uh, North Africa by uh, having a zoom uh, in the two main countries who are the most mature in, uh, in this topic, who are uh, Egypt and Morocco. And finally, my colleague will uh, present to you the role of Schneider Electric uh, in the e-mobility. So next slide, please. Yeah, so I uh, just gave the, uh, the agenda. Yes, thank you. Yes, as I said uh, precedently, so the uh, energy landscape is really changing. Uh, the, uh, the, the real reason of this transformation for sure is uh, the need of more decarbonization and the, re the request of uh, more digitized and electrifi electrified work. So um, here we summarize the, uh, the, uh, the energy landscape and you can see in the red the uh, generation and then in the yellow the, uh, the distribution in a very simplified way. So we are uh, observing few uh, trends. The first one is uh, the large thermal uh, plants are closing uh, more and more and uh, their number are reducing. Um, and then we, we are seeing more uh, renewable energies that uh, are decentralized and we can see them uh, in the different uh, part of the uh, energy landscape. We are also seeing, as um, was explained uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the webinar, uh, more requests for the uh, uh, battery-used storage, 
uh, in order to fulfill the uh, uh, the reusage of uh, these batteries. And we are seeing also uh, other arrangements uh, with the distribution utilities uh, in order to have more decentralized uh, energy resources. Uh, we are also seeing uh, more uh, load profiles to uh, the new technology. And finally, we can see also uh, at every stage of the uh, digital grid, uh, of the grid, sorry, a uh, new uh, source of energy that can be more and more renewable. So if you can go to the uh, next slide, please. In this, uh, uh, in this uh, landscape of energy, so uh, we can see uh, for the uh, electrical vehicles, we start to have more and more interest uh, from different stakeholders. So the utilities uh, understood the, uh, the opportunity and the potential of growth of electrical vehicles, and they are working in order to, uh, uh, to think or to produce a new way uh, of uh, participating in uh, this new uh, landscape. Oil and gas also, so they are working and uh, they start uh, to have more and more electrical vehicle uh, uh, chargers. Then we have uh, electrical mobility providers who, uh, who start to, uh, to increase their number. Uh, we have also uh, the um, new players uh, who are more digital, like uh, the startups or uh, uh, like the software companies who start to create and to develop uh, softwares in order to uh, improve the, uh, the customer experience and uh, to, uh, to uh, enhance the, uh, the connectivity and the, uh, uh, and, uh, the connectivity uh, between the uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders. And then you have um, other players like uh, like digital, like uh, Schneider Electric, where uh, in fact we uh, we are intervening uh, in order to uh, give more importance to the uh, uh, electrical vehicles, and the goal is to boost this transformation uh, by uh, bringing the uh, the concept and the, uh, the the new business model of uh, energy as services. So the goal is uh, also to uh, to uh, to help. Uh, the, uh, the government and the, uh, the public administration to invest more in this landscape by bringing uh, the financing. So uh, we are transferring, in fact, the, uh, the business model from a CapEx model to the OPEX uh, model. So uh, in a very nutshell, this is the, uh, the ecosystem that we see uh, about the uh, electrical vehicles. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So if we go now to uh, North Africa, so we can say that uh, we are at the very early stage uh, for sure. So we can count, in fact, the, uh, the number of vehicles by, uh, by hundreds and uh, not more. So comparing to the, uh, the, the, the most mature country uh, in Europe was uh, Norway, where uh, the electrical vehicle represents 53%. So there is a long way uh, to, uh, to go. Nevertheless, uh, this, this market is very interesting and uh, very important for us. Uh, first, in our, uh, uh, in our uh, battle for the uh, sustainability, as uh, uh, Roberto showed at the beginning. So uh, Africa uh, is contributing a lot in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. So uh, working in order to boost this transformation and going to the electrical vehicle uh, will help uh, the, uh, the sustainability purpose. Um, and uh, secondly, so uh, the, uh, the different analysis will show that in 2035, uh, we will go to uh, and will be more and more um, close to the, uh, the, the, the model of Europe where uh, most major country of Europe, sorry, where the electrical vehicle will be uh, representing 50% uh, uh, of the uh, of the uh, the fleet. So this uh, just to show that yes, in North Africa we are very uh, at the very early stage, but we see a real interest from the governments to go uh, into the uh, electrical vehicles, and uh, we will see a boom. Of, uh, of this uh, electrical vehicles uh, by two, uh, 2032, 2035. So uh, at the, uh, the right of the, uh, the slide, you can see 
the uh, uh, the map of uh, Middle East and Africa, and you see that uh, for sure Africa is uh, less advanced than Middle East in terms of infrastructure for electrical vehicle. Uh, the uh, the as I said at the beginning, the uh, in Africa the most advanced countries uh, in uh, in this uh, infrastructure are Morocco and Egypt. So if we can go to the uh, next slide, please. Okay, so if you, we start by uh, Egypt, we have a very strong signals uh, from the government to go through uh, this transformation. Uh, so at, at of, uh, as of today, we have uh, around 200 electrical vehicles, uh, but the, uh, the, the uh, Egyptian government is determined to, uh, to boost uh, this transformation, and uh, he uh, he's planning to build uh, about 1,000 fast charging stations uh, within the next three years. So uh, he's putting also in place uh, very favorable uh, legislation in order to boost uh, this transformation. So uh, uh, first by uh, putting in place uh, a taxes policy, which is uh, a reduced one for the electrical vehicles, but he's also signing some uh, uh, some agreement in order to allow uh, the uh, the Egyptian country uh, to be able to assemble or to uh, produce electrical vehicles, and we can see here uh, some of uh, the new players. We have exactly the same tendency for Morocco. So if you can uh, go to the uh, next slide, please. So uh, Morocco is a very interesting country because um, in 2018, uh, he was seen as the country where have the potential to be uh, among the top 18 uh, countries who will uh, be producing the electrical vehicles. So the, uh, the government is working in order to create this ecosystem and to allow the uh, production of uh, electrical vehicles. So we've seen uh, a lot of investment and a lot of uh, car producer uh, uh, to, uh, to be installed in, uh, in Morocco. Uh, so, uh, again, what uh, the uh, Moroccan government done uh, is to create a, a very favorable environment uh, for the industry of electrical vehicles uh, by giving tax benefits and uh, reducing the, uh, the bad for, uh, for the um, electrical uh, vehicles. So, we can see here uh, some key players. Uh, so, we have uh, three French uh, brand uh, for uh, uh, for um, automobile uh, producers who are Citroën, Peugeot, and uh, and Renault. Uh, we start also to see the uh, electrical vehicle charging in uh, in the gas stations. So uh, Vivo Energy, for example, uh, put in place, I, by memory, I think 15 uh, electrical vehicles around uh, Marrakesh in other the to uh, to able the uh, the recharging, and we see this uh, this gain of uh, of interest also thanks to the uh, COP22 uh, in Mar uh, in uh, Marrakesh. So um, overall, what we can say is um, uh, we see here a very um, a very big potential in this region of the world, uh, even if we are at the beginning of the uh, the journey. So uh, there is a long way to go. Uh, we can uh, say that uh, the uh, the willing of the government and the interest of the government are here. So uh, now, in order to do this transformation, it's a, it's a very collaborative uh, uh, process where the public and the uh, the private sectors need to work hands on hands uh, in order to put in place the uh, the necessary uh, infrastructure. Uh, now I will uh, pass the uh, the floor to my colleague Elias. Thank you, Amel. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Elias Miles. Um, I want to thank uh, the panel and the audience for having me in this uh, webinar. Uh, today I'm going to show you how Schneider Electric is uh, supporting uh, the mobility field. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
we do believe that uh, electricity is the future of uh, mobility. Uh, and we want to demonstrate that uh, a rapid scale up of an EV can be reached in uh, 10 years. That's why uh, last year Schneider Electric joined uh, the climate group uh, EV100 that has been uh, presented by uh, Giovanni at the beginning. It's, uh, it's gathering and bringing together a group of uh, influential businesses and organizations um, the aim is to fast track the shift of 100% fleet to electrical mobility. So we are committed to accelerate climate action fleet. Uh, this is in line with uh, our uh, group strategy, but this can be well supported only by a strong transitions to an electrical uh, vehicle uh, this is in order to bring down the direct uh, carbon emissions from a company car uh, to zero. And this is uh, what uh, the group has set as an ambition uh, to reach out by uh, 2030. As a solution provider, uh, we support uh, the government. As a solid partner, we are uh, bringing charger solutions to our uh, customer in the region including in North Africa through our ecostructure solutions. So um, we are going from the chargers to the grids and from the chargers to the panel and to the meters. Everything from energy management, power distributions, safety and reliability, uh, and uh, edge computing with uh, data collections and analytics. Um, in addition to that, uh, large organizations like uh, us uh, help and support company transitions to electrical fleets. Uh, we are investing, uh, we are partnering also with the startups, uh, innovative entrepreneurs, um, as well as uh, an ecostructure of people who doesn't have any legacy. So we could help them to do the extra miles and this is what we call uh, the Innovation at the Age program. So to summarize uh, our role and vision, Schneider Electric is a technology provider, an investor, uh, and the partners with innovative business model, enabling the acceleration of uh, EV charging deployment. Um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. This is to show you how the shift to electrical vehicle uh, is uh, completely changing the way we refill the car with energy. As you may know, uh, we have to go to gasoline stations uh, today. Tomorrow, uh, as the electricity is available everywhere, uh, you will recharge where you park your car. Obviously, uh, most of the time it will be at home through an AC existing uh, or um, an upgraded installation, but it will also be uh, wherever you go, means destinations, work or transit when randomly in the year. In fact, your distance uh, is exceeding uh, the autonomy of your battery. We also see uh, that uh, the fleet of vehicles having potentially uh, a specific need to recharge. Uh, for instance, it could be from a delivery suppliers to city bus uh, to a company fleet. Lastly, the uh, electrification of mobility will also concern whether a vehicle today could be filled out by oil, uh, it can be also by mining engines, uh, GSE, group uh, uh, ground service equipment in the airports to refill out the aircraft, move uh, people and cargoes. So I, what I want to tell you today is that uh, the uh, common point of all this key application is uh, the need uh, for smart connected, uh, scalable charging units uh, that can uh, offer uh, safety, reliability, uh, and data capture through um, analysis and software capabilities. As a conclusion, 
um, we can say that the EV charging infrastructure are now developing inside an ecosystem from the car to the facilities and to the grid, which will require more connections, for sure, more electronics uh, and more standard and communication protocol. Thank you for the attention and happy to answer to your question through the chat. Back to you, Giovanni. Thank you. Thank you, Elias. Thank you, Hamel. Uh, yes, uh, let's uh, let's uh, remember also that uh, in Marrakesh we have uh, Formula E. So Morocco is very sensitive to EVs also. So thank you for your presentation. Uh, let's go to Stefan Stefan Schaffer, uh, head of uh, Future Cities and Mobility at Tafri. Thank you, Stefan. Hello, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome from Munich. And uh, I wish I'd be there with you in person, but uh, let's do it now online. And I'd like to, I'm head, uh, I'm head of uh, Future Cities and Mobility at AFRI. And before we dive into the topic, I quickly want to say a few words about AFRI for those who might not have heard from us. Uh, next page, please. We are, um, a Scandinavian-based uh, company with, uh, well, international, so the, the roots are in uh, Sweden and Finland, and we are um, actually international. We have done, a, uh, we have a strong base also in Central Europe, and we have um, in Italy, for example, and we've also done a number of projects in uh, Africa, in the Middle East, and other parts of the world. We have um, uh, a long track record on sustainable solutions. That is uh, what, it's, what is important for us. Next page, please. From the organizational standpoint, we have uh, five divisions um, that you see here, infrastructure, process industries, industrial and digital solutions, energy, and management consulting. And I'm part of the management consulting team. And on the next page, you see our portfolio. So um, I'm heading the future cities and mobility portfolio, which is all about uh, urban planning and urban transport, uh, decarbonization of cities and of transport, smart lighting, smart and efficient buildings. Those are our themes. And uh, primarily we do market analysis and strategy consulting projects, but uh, also operational excellence or transaction services. On the next page, um, so we um, dive into the topic. Uh, so this is um, a picture there you see on the left from um, Europe, and uh, it shows that uh, transport sector is a significant uh, emitter of uh, greenhouse gas uh, and um, here in Europe uh, for example that is uh, the largest part um, that uh, emits uh, the largest sector that is emitting uh, greenhouse gases and um, so 1.1 uh, gigaton tons here in Europe and um, of course uh, most of the of the transport um, that's done today is driven by fossil fuels in Germany. For example, it's 98% uh, fossil fuels, only 2% are electric, and that already includes uh, electrified rail and uh, trams and undergrounds. Uh, so uh, a lot of transport modes that have been electric since many years. When we look at the overall um, consumption of uh, you know the various uh, modes and the, the vehicle types, it's clear that uh, passenger vehicles are around half of the uh, uh, causing half of the emissions uh, from transport uh, that are transport related. Half of the greenhouse gas emissions are coming from cars. That uh, can we move on to the next page, please? Here um, we have looked at, uh, okay, specifically in Morocco, let's zoom in a little bit uh, and uh, move over to Africa. In particular, Morocco is going to be our example for today. And uh, I'm going to tell you in a moment why. And uh, so when we look at Morocco, it becomes clear there on the right hand side of the chart, you see the number of registered vehicles in Morocco has increased by a factor of four between 1990 to 2017 and um, that is going to continue and uh, uh, maybe 
even accelerating and uh, in other African countries that uh, the same is going to happen or has happened. And um, that is uh, also a part of the um, uh, development of countries and um, so that uh, people as they become uh, you know, more wealthy want to buy um, uh, vehicles uh, and want to be mobile and we see that uh, very strongly also in places like China and India so um, private car ownership and the wish for the demand for mobility it's growing with um, economic development and uh, there on the left you can see what this means for in terms of emissions and there you can also see a steady curve that's going up for the last uh, 20 years or so um, also coming um, from transport uh, so co2 emissions are strongly on the rise also because of transport now um, this is the, the situation this is the scenario and because of that on the next page um, you see um, now uh what uh you know uh, how we have investigated this uh, can we change the slide please um we as um afri my uh, colleagues um from sorry can we go to the next page please yes thank you so my my um Colleagues from uh, AFRI in Italy, um, together with NL Morocco, have done a, a study and um, also, by the way, together with the Moroccan Policy Center to look at um, energy scenarios up to 2050 in Morocco. So the decarbon decarbonization path from Morocco um, is the name of the study. And uh, my colleagues are here on the call as well, and uh, they would be able to um, answer more specific uh, questions if you have. Um, what they have done is that um, we looked at the um, uh, well decarbonization. Uh, we took the annual standard carbonization approach and tailored that to Morocco's uh, context, and we identified decarbonization path up to 2050. We did a cost benefit analysis and uh, identified effectively effective policy measures. So um, the results are evaluation of the various scenarios and suggestions how, um, you know, what policy measures can be taken. Uh, please uh, move on to the next page. And um, there you see um, three different scenarios that we have been looking at. Uh, first of all, on top of the, um, uh, the, the upper curve there is the business as usual scenario, meaning if um, everything, if Morocco stays to the commitments they have already given to, um, for example, through the Paris Agreement, um, then um, so we, uh, Morocco would end up with uh, more than 200 uh, megatons of CO2 emission per per year. And um, so we have uh, looked at uh, now two alternative scenarios, how these emissions can be decreased. The first scenario that's marked as the one, that's the increased emissions uh, scenario. And um, the assumptions there were that uh, by 2030, emissions will be reduced by 25% and by 2050 emissions are going to be reduced by 56%. The second scenario, they are marked as the um, green development uh, that as with the two, that's the green development uh, scenario and their assumptions were, what if we uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 by 40 percent and in 2050 by 74 percent that is what we looked at and then uh, let's look at the uh, at the results so what's uh, let's go to the next uh, slide please and um, so as um, uh, here you see again a comparison of the three scenarios on the left the business as usual scenario and that clearly shows that um, if uh, Morocco does nothing, if they continue as it's planned at the moment, um, we see a strong increase in also transport related greenhouse gases. So that means from today, uh, where uh, transport in Morocco is around 
half, uh, no, sorry, it's about one third of the CO2 emissions. It's going to grow by 2050 up to more than half of the uh, CO2 emissions would come from transport. And that obviously is not a sustainable uh, way. And um, so that would, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really significant. So that's why on the, uh, in the two other scenarios, um, there you see um, this trend will be broken in 2030 and 2050. And both of these scenarios, uh, the emissions are going to be reduced and uh, in one case in the increased ambition case uh, by, to uh, by 56 percent and in the um, in the green development case by 74 uh, percent to 31 and uh, 15 um, sorry that's megatons per year okay so uh, let's move on uh, to the next uh, page, please. And there you see what uh, would it mean if we achieve, if we um, want to go to, to the next page, please. What if we would um, uh, now implement these scenarios? What do those mean? Can we go to the next page, please? Thank you. So this is um, uh, where you see, um, you know, what, it, what does it mean um, to move to these alternative scenarios away from the business as usual? And uh, so in, um, there's, a, first of all, a separation between urban areas and rural areas to acknowledge the fact that um, electric mobility requires um, charging infrastructure. We heard a lot about it. And um, that's uh, it's uh, quite straightforward, or it's um, there. They can there's a quite straightforward business case in densely populated areas in cities, but um, it's much harder to um, well either technically or financially implement that in rural areas. So that's why um, now here the um, assumption was that in the increased ambition scenario the share of electrified cars and motorbikes and light utility vehicles in urban areas um, goes up to 80%. In the green development case, up to 100%. In rural areas, it goes up to 30%. And in the green development area, up to 70%. 70% of the vehicles will be electric than in rural areas by 2050. And uh, there's also um, the uh, electrification of buses by 2040 and the electrification of trains by 2030. That's going to be part in both uh, scenarios. And then the, the share of trucks using hydrogen uh, would increase by 2050 in the scenario one to 50% and in the scenario two to 85%. And lastly, the share of diesel vehicles um, would be uh, zero percent. So no diesel, no diesel vehicles anymore by 2050. So if we do that, and uh, let's move on to the next slide, please, then um, we would see the following. So greenhouse gas emissions are uh, really decreasing other than what you see there on the left in the business as usual scenario, in the two other scenarios, we see that uh, greenhouse gases are really, the emission is uh, decreasing very significant, significantly. Um, and um, that's really why, why we're doing it. So that's uh, really, uh, those are efficient means um, that have been uh, modeled here. And then secondly, in the lower uh, half of the slide, you see that uh, the energy consumption is changing to uh, electricity, hydrogen, and some gas. Diesel is completely uh, eliminated. And uh, you can see compared to the business as usual scenario, how significant the hydrogen and the electricity shares are. So um, the, and the, the overall um, energy consumption 
is still is increasing of course because uh, you know there's more cars more vehicles and um, but it's not as strongly as in the BOU scenario so the increase of energy consumption is quite slow and um, in the uh, green development scenario it's um, only half of the energy that is that would be used compared to the business as usual scenario so those are very significant uh, changes and then on the next side on the next page please let's turn on the let's move on to the next page we see what it means um, economically so this um, and this is really important the accelerated decarbonization of transport results in lower fuel economy costs costs compared to the BAU scenario. What has been done here is uh, um, the, the team has accumulated all the costs until 2050 for these two scenarios and uh, also looked at uh, including in, invest, um, investing in charging infrastructure. In scenario one, uh, it's a 9 billion investment. In scenario two, it's a 12 billion investment into charging infrastructure. And still the overall cost compared to the business as usual scenario is in scenario one, 117 billion less. In um, scenario two, 212 billion US dollars less than in the BAU scenario. So that is really significant, a significant um, economic uh, benefit. And uh, so this clearly shows that um, electric mobility is not only environmentally friendly, but it's also it also makes sense from a business perspective. Let's move on to the next page, please. And um, the um, there was already at the, in the introductory session by Roberto Vigotti, uh, uh, he already mentioned that uh, traffic should not become as crazy as in Rome, uh, hopefully. And uh, this uh, this is where. And I also saw learned this morning that uh, bike sharing is already established in Morocco for uh, some time. And um, here um, I want to uh, you know mention and. Um, one one point so this is uh, and this has not been done as part of the study it's uh, it's an observation that um, that i want to add so micro mobility uh, electric bikes and uh, micro mobility are also excellent means for carbonizing transport uh, around the globe and um, we should not only uh, look at cars but um, uh, really reducing traffic uh, jams or congestions and uh, making uh, using this the space uh, wisely that has a lot to do with a uh, smaller size vehicle which are often cheaper and faster for many trips and um, uh, the city or is, is just becoming smaller when you have uh, you know the, these kind of vehicles that are more flexible and um, they also can address um, health issues there on the on the right by the way you see um, the adoption curve of uh, electric bikes in Germany and uh, you see there's a strong increase that happened especially during the last year and um, so it's not uh, it's uh, the, I want to make the point that also very uh, developed countries are uh, you know jumping on bikes and uh, it's a it's a very efficient way to get around uh, but of course there must be suitable infrastructure for example a lot of bikes bike lanes or good bike lanes and um, uh, many of the uh, governments uh, in Europe and in the US are investing in exactly that this is a prerequisite Let's move on to the next page, another observation that I want to make, and um, that is on, on sharing, uh, sharing mobility. And um, so the, the bike share that was mentioned earlier, that is a really big and important step, and then uh, it can be expanded to other areas uh, from bikes to motorbikes uh, to or, sorry, electric mopeds and um, to um, and uh, to electric uh, vehicles and um, that helps accelerating the shift to electric mobility because um, the all shared vehicles are heavily utilized assets it's not 
that the, the, uh, the privately owned car stands around for 98% of the time during the day it's not being used. Shared vehicles are constantly being used. And because of that, investments in vehicles, in uh, the charging infrastructure and the grid also pays out more rapidly. And uh, so this, is, uh, this helps bootstrapping the, the whole uh, infrastructure. And then secondly, um, the uh, shared solutions are also making electric mobility accessible for many and uh, could maybe even reduce the number of privately owned vehicles. We see this in uh, developed countries that a lot of people say, I don't need my own car. I use one when I, when I need it. And um, that also uh, you know, makes it available for many and reduces the number of cars. So uh, with this, I want to move on to the last slide and uh, make the conclusion. And um, so just to quickly uh, repeat what I just, uh, you know, highlight a, a few things. The, the transport sector is the largest uh, greenhouse gas emitter in Morocco. And uh, without action, it would grow to more than half of all emissions. And um, to reverse this trend, um, we, um, there can be, well, a number of scenarios or two scenarios have been identified and um, there, one of those allows to reduce um, the greenhouse gas emissions by 74% against the business as usual. There's also an economic benefit and the faster Morocco shifts, and that's the same is true for other uh, countries, the faster the shift to electric uh, mobility, the higher the economic benefit. And in the case of Morocco, it adds up to $212 billion by 2050. Shared mobility can keep uh, can make uh, an impact to accelerate the shift and uh, provide uh, you know solutions for many people and utilize the uh, investments very highly, very wisely. Uh, but what we saw is um, there's a lack in enabling policy and tax incentives and subsidies. And uh, once they are brought in place, that will accelerate the adoption of the of electric mobility very significantly. One more page, please. So those are my contact details. And um, if uh, we can, uh, you know, if you have any questions, if we can uh, help you with anything, please reach out and uh, connect with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, let's move on to the next, uh, the next uh, relator. Uh, with Sam El Bas, co-founding partner, CEO, and energy consultant at Nexus Analytica. So oh, can can you hear me? Giovanni? Okay, yes. I ca I cannot yeah. see you. Yep, I'm just setting it up somehow. Technical error has happened. Okay, can you see me now? Okay. Yes, okay. Thank Perfect. you, Rastam. Glad to see this. So, um, I would like to thank you very much for the introduction. I would like also to thank the other panelists for the highly interesting presentations, including your presentation, Giovanni, Dino, Wim, Anna, and of course, the Stefan. Um, I would be more than glad today to share a Nexus Analytica perspective on e-mobility from Cairo EGEP. And I will be sharing my presentation for the next 15 minutes. And of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to write this on the chat or to keep it for the Q&A session. Can we move to the next slide, please? So uh, today I will be covering multiple topics. Uh, definitely I will discuss the market status quo and the market design in North Africa with a focus on the Egyptian energy sector, specifically, or given that Amel and Stefan have already also covered a great deal about Morocco. Then I will be focusing on our uh, forecasting model uh, at Nexus Analytica and compare it to the current targets provided by the state and the government. And of course, finally, I will get into the policies, regulatory trends, and the solutions we are providing at Nexus Analytica. However, before we get into this, maybe I'll give you a little bit introduction about who we are and what we are doing at Nexus. Can we move to the next slide, please? 
Perfect. So um, Next Analytic is a limited liability company. We have been established in 2019, offering basically consultancy and IoT solutions for the energy and industrial sector. We have three focal areas or three work areas in general. One of them is big data analytics, where we offer complete and deployed solutions. And data analytics is specifically for the energy sector, with a focus of the African markets based on our technical and also local expertise. In the modeling and simulation builder, we offer simulation model on the macro scale, regional models, or even micro models. For example, we can simulate what's going to happen in Africa if uh, every con conventional car has been turned into an electric vehicle, and we can even simulate the micro systems, the electric vehicle system itself alone connected to a simple house with a schooling system, energy management system at a micro scale. And of course, uh, today I would be discussing one of our regional models later within this presentation. And last but not least is the uh, typical strategic consultancy, which we provide for the governmental bodies, international agencies, in addition to the private sector. Can we uh, move to the next slide, please? So even, even though we are a relatively uh, young company, we have been working with uh, different international institutions, including AUD, Friedrich Eber Stiftung, EU, or even World Bank, and the typical governmental entities in Egypt and in North Africa, as going to be discussed later. We have developed multiple products, including Nexus Charge, which is dedicated to e-mobility, which we're going to discuss later within this slide. I would like to give you a little bit more focus or a little bit more details about our thematic topics in our next slide. So e-mobility is definitely one of our major topics at Next Analytic. And I'm very proud to say that at Nexus, our experts have been involved in each and every e-mobility projects in Egypt. We offer the typical ramp up models, tariff structure, policies, market simulation, in addition to several technical topics relevant to energy management and optimal charging scheduling, specifically for e mobility. And this is only one of our thematic topics. We work also in energy market, energy policy and regulation, energy system, power, power to X, specifically hydrogen potential assessment and typical business models, smart building energy management, and the integration of. Uh, renewable energies in micro and mini grids in Africa, specifically in the sub Saharan region, in addition to the typical control of conventional plants. Can we go to the next slide, please? Those are our um, clients, and here, as you can see, we are working with governmental institutions, private sectors, almost all the developing operations, and we have several partnerships, memberships, and contributions not only in Egypt, which is our headquarters, but also in, in Morocco and different other countries in Africa. And now I would like to move along with the overview of the status quo in North Africa. Can we move to the next slide, please? So um, as mentioned by um, Emil and Stefan, the North African market is relatively at the very early stage. You can see from this simple infographs that the number of charging stations all over Africa, for example, Egypt is a maximum of 74 locations. I believe we do have 50 more uh, from another CBO or from different CBO, however, they are currently out of service. And the second country coming up to Egypt in this case is Morocco. And in Morocco, as discussed by uh, the other bandits and colleagues, it has started in 2016 as multiple initiatives between universities and car manufacturers, and now it's developing more and more along the time. However, looking to the North African market status quo, it's basically being moved by, or the prime movers are Morocco and Egypt in the current status quo. In Egypt, the interest started in 2017, and we we'll reached it to the moment that we have multiple targets and strategies which I'm going to discuss in the next slides. However, for the remaining countries, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya, uh, there are still no public data policies or targets available. And this can be simply reflected by the number of charging locations already existing, which are basically uh, in hotels or a few camping areas, just based on a specific interest of specific people in this case. However, there's still no national targets that's available publicly. That's why uh, 
whenever we are speaking about immobility now, our main two prime movers are Egypt and Morocco in this case. And as that sense, uh, we have spoken a great deal about Morocco. I would like to give you a little bit more insight about the Egyptian sector. Can we move to uh, the next slide? So this slide simply summarizes the timeline of what happened in Egypt. It started in 2017, where there has been a huge interest by the different governmental entities. We are speaking about the Ministry of Electricity and Renewable Energy, New and Renewable Energy Agency, and the Ministry of Environment and different other entities, including the Egyptian Electricity Regulator, who have shown a huge interest in the integration of electromobility in the Egyptian energy sector in this case. And then this interest was developed into action by the developing agencies where four studies have been financed by the World Bank, GIZ, and the EBRD in the UK. Following uh, this interest and motivation, few decrees have been issued in 2018. And those decrees has been by the Minister of Trade and the Presidential Decree. The Minister of Trade has move the market through this uh, decree of 255 or to 2018, which allows the import of the used cars from Europe and worldwide. And then the presidential decree came and exempted all the EVs from the custom duties. And we are speaking about lightweight vehicles. In this case, we have been fully exempted. And for the electric bus, it was a 40% exemption. Uh, in 2019, uh, there has been another move by the cabinet which has delegated the Ministry of Military Production to develop an Egyptian strategy to promote, to promote the use of EVs in Egypt and to do some phases and targets for the Egyptian government to follow. And we will discuss definitely this aspect in the next few minutes. And then in November 2019, the official strategy after the delegation was then announced. In 2020, uh, the cabinet has also announced a set of incentives to promote the use of EV and raise the share of local manufacturing and was basically announced by uh, the Minister of Public Enterprise. And then the Egyptian regulators started to move to put a damper structure for the CBOs to enable them to sell electricity or to charge EVs. However, it's still under review at this moment. Then finally, at the end of the year, December 2020, they allowed officially the permanent registration scheme of the EVs. In 2021, there have been also few updates till the moment, till this month, actually a few days ago. It started by the Nasr Automotive collaboration with Don Peng Automobile to manufacture locally the Nasr E70 or a local EV. And then once this was announced in May 21, which is, I mean, this month, the Minister of Trade or the Ministry of Trade and Industry has banned the import of used vehicles and then consequently cancelled the decree announced in 2018, which is number 155. To move to the next steps, I would like to give you um, an overview about the strategy of uh, the MOM or the Ministry of Military Production, which represents the targets of Egypt. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, it had simply a vision to put Egypt on the forefront of the EV manufacturing on the global map to support both the national economy and achieve sustainable development. The target was as follows to have um, an EV share of 36% by 2035 and 50% by 2040, and to have the industrial share of 65% accordingly. And of course, this would be to a contribution, to have a contribution of this industry to the GDP by 5% and reduce the health risk and environmental risk by 97% according to the MOM strategy. And this strategy has came in, in three uh, basic phases. Phase one, which is between 2019 and 2024 to promote the use of EVs and encourage local manufacturing. And phase two, to deepen the role of manufacturing uh, by having or positioning Egypt in a proper position for the R&D. And phase three, which is to expand to the global market and or specifically the African market in this case. Uh, can we move to the next slide? 
This strategy had basic uh, three pillars that are aligned with uh, Egypt 2030 vision or the uh, and the United Nations Sustainable Development uh, Goals in the energy environment, knowledge economy, and urban development. The three pillars was simply to strengthen the local manufacturing and increase the charging infrastructure, and last but not least, to, uh, to uh, improve the existing fleet rehabilitation. Those were more or less the three pillars targeted by the government in this case. I would like to, to give you more insights or more numbers about the current status quo in the upcoming slide. This is the EV figures of the current status quo. So as you can see, we have in Egypt in the meantime, based on our analysis, less than 1,000 vehicles. We are speaking exactly uh, around 486 electric vehicles. Most of them are coming from the USA uh, and only a few coming from the EU and the rest is coming, of course, from Asia. And as you can see from the graph on the left, 90% of those vehicles are used and only 5% to 7% are brand new vehicles. And this was more or less based on the uh, regulation or the decree of the Ministry of Industry and Trade. And also, as you can see in the left graph, most of them was or is a battery electric vehicle and not hybrid, and the hybrid represent only 10%. When we look to the private charging infrastructure uh, based on the graph on the right, we can see that we have around 100 charging stations. 50% of them are out of service because one of the companies of in Egypt has ran out of business in this case. And they are basically, um, or the socket that's being used in the meantime is more or less the European Type 2, which represents a major uh, socket or connector in this case. Can we uh, move to the other slide, please? This slide gives you uh, more or less a detailed insight over the overall market uh, ecosystem and stakeholders. So we have typically, uh, like any other country, we have the different sources or different energy mix supplying the distribution companies or being delivered by an IPP. And we have the owners who are connected directly to the CEO. It is planned to have 100 public charging stations, even in the recent announcement uh, this month, that is announced to have 300 uh, or sorry, 3,000 uh, public charging stations. It is still not clear um, if they are going to be owned by the state or by the uh, public enterprise or the Ministry of Electricity and Renewable Energy, or are they are going to be from the private sector in this case. And uh, of course, those are going to be installed and maintained by the CPOs. Typically, in Europe, and specifically in Germany, there are sometimes some roaming, roaming hubs connecting CPOs with also uh, the MSBE or the mobile really service providers. However, it's still non existent in the Egyptian uh, ecosystem. And all of this is definitely connected to the OEMs and dealerships and the battery manufacturing. And uh, of course, as I said, in the meantime, dealerships are mostly selling used vehicles based on the, uh, the Ministry of Industry and Trade of 2018. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, this figure represents the, uh, the ICE uh, uh, or sales in the previous year from 2010 to 2020 the typical automotive sales from the different OEMs. And you can see it was by the different political situation of the Arab Spring, the political stability till the COVID-19. What was interesting or what people expect is because of the quarantine, there would be less car sales uh, because people are preparing to stay at home. However, based on the latest statistics uh, announced by the AMIC annual reports, the city has increased in 2020 and this people because they prepare to have their own vehicles now in the corona situation compared to the uh, public transportation. And what's going to happen in 2021 is still a question. However, it definitely uh, varies depending on the macroeconomic situation, consumer behavior, and of course the country collector trends. And accordingly, we try to do our modeling or to do our 
more or less analysis to forecast the share of electric vehicle among these ICE figures in the meantime. Can we move to uh, the next slide, please? The uh, next slide. Um, in, at Nexus Analytica, we have a very, very detailed electric vehicle random model or update model, which details all or inputs all the EV technical parameters, both and regulations, the EV cost of ownership, and even the social and cons uh, social and consumer attributes of the African stakeholders in this case, in addition to the infrastructure. And accordingly, uh, we connected to the economic development and historic vehicle ownership data to finally conclude the total market stock of electric vehicles or the total share of private and public electric vehicles in North Africa, or in this case, in our model, in Egypt, in this case. I would like to show you or to present to you the results of this model to give you an impression of the current status quo and how far it differs from the current targets that has been publicly announced. Can, can we move to the next slide, please? In the blue graph, we can see the MOM or the Ministry of Military Production targets for 2025 and 2035 and 2040, which is 14%, 36%, and 50% respectively, which is published in 2019. And the other graph, which is in, in blue, you can see the current expectation based on our models. And you, as you can see from here, there is still a huge gap between the expected sales number or target sales number by the state and our basis, uh, our basic scenario or base scenario. And this includes also or can be reflected in the share of EV sales uh, presented by the mom or the targeted and the actual share from the old model. In this case, or um, would we, or can we say that we cannot reach our targets if we just assume that the current regulatory scheme and current status quo is as this? I would say it would be very hard to reach the targets. However, in Egypt, you can simply see more regulations coming up, like the last decree that has been announced. We can see more actions from the NASCO. And if this happened, I would believe 100% we can even exceed this target in 2025, 2035, and 2040 in this case. However, this result is just reflecting the current status quo based on the current uh, market attributes that we are seeing now. Can we uh, move to the next slide? Over here, I would just try to reflect uh, why our model represented this data and uh, how we included this kind of attributes to represent uh, the current EV shares. In the meantime, as previously explained by uh, Giovanni and all the other panelists and colleagues, that we have multiple barriers, including costs, uh, charging time, driving range, and charging infrastructure. On the left, this is an, an actual photo from the social media showing the current or the techniques people are now using to charge their electric vehicle at home. Simply, he can be living in the third or fourth floor and just dropping a cable to his EV and more or less put it behind the window to make sure the, that the slow charger is not stolen and then get a cable out to charge his vehicle. Typically, with the cost or uh, the degree of the used vehicle, uh, importing the used vehicle has more or less tolerated or made up for the cost because they can purchase it used cars from Europe or the US at a low price. However, they have been always, um, I would say, a range anxiety and a charging infrastructure anxiety. The range anxiety is being more or less tolerated now by the manufacturer, maybe better cars, bigger batteries with better efficiency for longer range. However, the real challenge for North Africa is the charging infrastructure. Can we uh, move to the next slide? The next one. To uh, tolerate or to start the promoting for EVs in North Africa, we have to really think from the North African perspective or the uh, people's perspective. That's why we have to include the consumer behavior. Not every solution that's feasible in Europe can be feasible in North Africa. For example, you can see charging stations uh, in Europe, in the streets, uh, anywhere. However, in Egypt, you can see it only in charging station. And this is for one reason, or sorry, in the fuel station or gasoline station. And this for one reason is 
vandalism. You have to look to the industry and the private sector and how they are contributing to this market, the technological readiness, and in this case also the local technological readiness, the energy markets, macroeconomic development of the communities, and last but not least, the policy and regulatory trends. In the next slide, I will, I will show you uh, a little bit more details about the policy and regulatory trends, and this can be simply summarized in those four steps in Asia. Step number one is simply to issue EV-friendly policies, and this is what we have seen already. Step number two, two, which has already also happened, is to permit the regulation and regulation uh, permit and regulate the EV public charging station. In the meantime, it is permitted. However, they are not allowed to sell electricity. That's why, for the current operating CPO in Egypt, he is selling electricity for free. And then the step three, once with an increase in demand of charging station. Uh, we will see more regulations and policies uh, to support having them widespread even at, uh, at buildings and even at hotels and even at other locations. And step number four is to increase typically the number of charging stations according to the demands that has been risen. Last but not least, uh, in, slide, uh, in the next slide, I would like to share with you one of the solutions, which um, I believe solves the current chicken egg problem. Is that should we have uh, should we until we have more electric vehicles to have charging infrastructure, or should we have the charging infrastructure to have more electric vehicles? So we came up with this solution, uh, Nexus Charge, which is a peer-to-peer -peer charging platform, allowing anybody and any person to share even his wall socket to charge EVs. He just says, I have this full socket at this location, you can charge it. Of course, the lowest power is 3.7 kilowatt in this case. And you reserve it, and then once an EV registers and signs up and reserve and charges the EV, he has to pay for the electricity he has consumed. It also works for uh, the apartment buildings, where they can simply have one, for example, DC charging station and share its use and share also its cost in this case. Um, next slide. I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, I hope I gave you an overview of our next analytical perspective. And of course, if you have any question, please feel free to uh, post it to the chat or the QA session or even write or contact me by email or phone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Let's go to the next one, the last one, last speaker, Valerio Vadacchino from NLX, uh, Head of Global Marketing. I leave the floor, Valerio. Ciao. We cannot hear you, Valerio. What about now, Giovanni? Okay, okay. Okay, sorry guys. So good morning everybody. Thank you for um, uh, inviting me in uh, sharing the experience uh, of NL and NLX in the electrification of public transportation. <clears throat> uh, so this is Valerio Patacchino, Head of Marketing within Global ECD. That is the business line within, uh, within NLX that uh, uh, focuses on um, uh, services for public administration with specific focus on electrification of, uh, of public transport. Um, so, uh, before going uh, in depth uh, on the topic of today, I would like just to give you very few numbers about uh, NL, just for the ones that uh, doesn't, don't know us. Um, so, Joanne, if you can move on, or the, the little one more, perfect. So, we, operate, we are one of the largest energy utility around the world, uh, operating across all the energy sector uh, value chain uh, from generation, mainly renewables. Some of the uh, almost uh, five gigawatt of installed capacity are also placed in operation in Africa and North Africa in particular. Uh, then uh, uh, we have uh, 74 million uh, customers and families connected to our grid globally. Uh, we, sell, uh, we sell electricity and gas to almost 70 million customers uh, um, in the free market. Uh, and then uh, within specific NLX, we are the largest operator of uh, demand response and flexibility services uh, uh, globally. 
uh, going more in details about NLX in the next slide. Uh, we are the um, recent uh, born uh, uh, division of NL Group uh, focused on energy transition. Uh, we have three main uh, uh, business lines focused on customer segments, so ECT, business to government, e industries, business to business, and uh, e-home, business to consumer. And then we have a three product line, uh, e-mobility that uh, actually is active uh, in all the topics that we have uh, discussed today, um, uh, from a public infrastructure, uh, charging infrastructure to um, solution and products for uh, uh, electric mobility uh, for private customer. Then we have financial services uh, that is focused on all the uh, digital uh, payment services uh, for all the business line. And then we have one specific product line focused on fiber uh, optic on uh, ultra broadband uh, um, uh, infrastructure. Um, so the pillars of NLX are basic, basically uh, platformization, dig digitalization that, uh, that are also uh, pretty um, uh, common uh, and uh, uh, needed uh, within uh, uh, electric mobility uh, business development. Uh, and then integration and ecosystem of uh, different uh, kind of services within NLX and also uh, uh, bringing on board uh, uh, third party uh, startup or other companies um, to provide value to final customer. Um, next, please. Um, so let's go in details uh, about what we are doing uh, to support public administration, government, the public transport operator in electrifying their fleet. Um, with our experience uh, uh, started uh, um, in Latin America and had uh, a very big growth in Latin America where um, policies and governments in particular uh, starting from Chile, Colombia, Brazil is also moving over there, have uh, set up uh, a specific regulation uh, uh, in order to uh, accelerate uh, the uh, transition uh, and the renovation uh, of uh, uh, public transport fleet. Uh, first of all, let me clarify that when we talk about uh, electrification of uh, transport, uh, it's uh, a little bit easier, rather, I mean, pretty much uh, easier to uh, work on electrification of a fleet. Why? because uh, uh, you are dealing with uh, uh, a service that could be public transport, but could also be logistics or other kind of uh, uh, fleet uh, uh, services, where you have uh, um, uh, a defined, uh, a pretty well known in advance um, uh, figures and details of the service. You know, for example, that uh, bus goes from uh, uh, point A, to point B every day, uh, the bus is going to stop uh, uh, within the route uh, uh, 10, 20, uh, 20 times uh, uh, each, each route uh, with a specific uh, uh, timeline, uh, within a specific uh, um, kilometers uh, uh, and distance range. So it's a pretty well predictable service that uh, sweet uh, uh, and fits very well with an electrification process. Uh, if we go next, uh, sorry, um, next slide. Then thanks to uh, the approach that some of, uh, again, governments starting from Chile have uh, uh, put in, uh, in place. So um, inviting uh, private uh, companies to support and to accelerate, to foster and boost the air electrification uh, program. We also set up a sort of uh, a journey in which uh, uh, skilled uh, and uh, capable companies uh, in dealing with energy um, uh, sector could stay side by side with public transport operator, try to uh, maximize and optimize uh, the uh, size of the fleet uh, and the, the uh, in particular size and management uh, of the uh, depot where all these uh, electric buses need to be um, uh, charged uh, uh, and uh, um, stored uh, uh, during the night, uh, usually considering the public transport uh, uh, service schedule. So, the uh, first uh, um, advice that I can share with all the people uh, uh, today that uh, 
again, uh, governments uh, uh, like uh, Chile and, and uh, Colombia government have uh, uh, set up is to base the, the uh, to base the electrification process uh, on uh, uh, two main pillars: um, total cost of ownership, that uh, is, uh, um, uh, I would say. A, a real uh, um, uh, topics on which you can uh, uh, actually evaluate uh, uh, the uh, goodness of a technology versus others. So you need to figure out not uh, uh, if you are uh, buying well at time zero, rather if you are buying well or you are getting a, a better services along lifetime of the vehicle in this case. So one approach of the tenders uh, that we are bidding in and that the um, uh, local uh, authority in Latin America are uh, issuing are based on TCO. So they are comparing, uh, they are putting competition um, different technologies, uh, electric, uh, uh, internal combustion. So without any kind of specific uh, benefit, let me say, but they would like to evaluate the technologies along the lifetime of the vehicle so uh, not only uh, uh, at time zero and this is and this is key because maybe today i'm really happy because i'm spending a very very few money to buy an old uh, uh, or even a euro six uh, or a modern uh, uh, diesel bus but then along uh, 10 uh, years time of the uh, of, of the management of this bus i'm spending a lot so today, electric bus are already competitive in terms of TCO with the internal combustion engine uh, vehicle, either uh, LNG, CNG, or uh, diesel one. Um, and then uh, they are also looking at uh, uh, modernizing their fleet, uh, renewing their fleet in uh, a so-called as a service business model. What does it mean? It means that uh, instead of putting a lot of uh, public funds at time, t uh, at time zero on top of the table try to foster and accelerate the uh, acquisition and purchasing of these buses in the market with the risk to have this money uh, uh, or part of this money wasted because there is not a, a proper uh, design of electrification phase. They are looking at the market uh, for private company like Enel uh, in order to uh, provide them with a full package, um, including uh, the availability of vehicle uh, that could stay again side by side uh, um, uh, with uh, public uh, authorities, uh, public transport operator along uh, uh, the duration of the, of the contract, that usually is uh, 10 up to 14 years following the lifetime of the vehicle. In that case, uh, the technology risk considering that public transport authority or public transport operator have not yet a lot of experience and knowledge in managing electric mobility, the technology could be moved on the shoulder of private company that have also uh, the opportunity to uh, bring on the table additional financing, so additional uh, funds, uh, in order to accelerate and uh, uh, multiply the number of electric vehicles, the electric bus in this case, that could be uh, in operation since uh, uh, day one. And on top of that, uh, again, a private company, in particular energy utility, could uh, support uh, um, uh, during the contract duration uh, the optimization and the maximization of savings brought by the electrification project. If you go next, uh, you can see in a uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you can, you can see here in a in a very fancy um, uh, slide. Uh, I mean, the, the journey that uh, we have set up, uh, that, that, that we have put uh, uh, together in order to again uh, um, uh, be side by side with uh, with the public transport operator and the local authority, and providing a different kind of services that could be. Um, included or not within the full package, uh, tailored with the specific need of the uh, project or the city of the routes uh, that uh, wants to be electrified first. And goes from uh, a key uh, activities that is the planning advisory, where we take care of uh, uh, analyzing uh, uh, the services, the public transport services uh, um, in operation today with the traditional buses, 
and uh, we are going to uh, optimize uh, the electrification program for specific routes or for the full uh, um, uh, system, uh, public transport system of the city, in order again to properly size uh, the electric bus fleet, the new electric bus fleet, to properly size the recharging infrastructure at the bus depot or if needed uh, the so-called opportunity charging so the um uh, the biberonage uh, along the along the route uh, that buses might need in case of the long uh, distance uh, um uh, of the of the of the single routes and then on top of that uh, considering the public transport system as a sort of backbone uh, of uh, uh, of a smart city uh, we can also include uh, um, different kind of services uh, to uh, in improve uh, the public transport service itself or even or even uh, integrate uh, um, value added services for the citizens or for other part of the uh, of other uh, department or organization of the city if we, move, if we move next, um, so on top of the um, uh, say journey that I just shared with you, basically the building block that uh, uh, of the offering and, and of the um, value proposition that we have developed uh, again, starting from uh, the uh, market request in Latin America, is, is based on three uh, on three building blocks. So one is the vehicle, so whatever is uh, related to, the, to an electric bus, the product, uh, the option on the product, uh, the so-called full services, so ordinary and extraordinary maintenance of the, of the vehicle along the, its lifetime. Then the, the building block two that actually is the most relevant one because many, many times it's uh, considered like a sort of constraint and barrier. So, so everything related to charging and energy uh, infrastructure um focused on the uh, um, uh recharging the electric bus and then the third block that i just mentioned uh, in the previous slides that's so called smart mobility or smart city services that are sort of uh, cherries on top of the cake uh, uh, in order to uh, improve uh, again the effectiveness uh, uh, and the goodness uh, of the electrification project for sure this is a, this is a, um, a modular uh, value proposition that uh, is uh, um, uh, tailored uh, uh, and suited uh, uh, based on the specific need of the specific city or the specific project. If we go next, uh, sorry. Then this is maybe the most relevant, uh, um, uh, I would say, topic that I would like to highlight today. Uh, and that is related to the business model. So again, uh, as I mentioned in, during the introduction, uh, the real game changer in this scheme is not properly, uh, uh, I mean, changing a vehicle, an internal combustion vehicle with an electric one. That is clearly the, the most visible part of uh, an electrification project. But in that specific regard, so for what concerns electrification or public transportation, the, new, the business model has been really the key element uh, to um, uh, make this uh, transition a reality. Uh, again, starting from Latin America, but uh, we are seeing uh, this kind of business model uh, um, developed, uh, developed also in other parts uh, of, of the world. Uh, so again, the private companies or has uh, took care of doing all the investment at the beginning, for example, uh, the renovation of uh, 100 electric bus in Santiago de Chile, that was our first project in 2017, 17, 18. So we took care of everything we took care of buying the buses we took care of uh, putting money up front uh, to buy the buses we took care of designing uh, and construct the uh, charging infrastructure at the depot uh, we took care of uh, providing green energy to uh, recharge the electric bus so a, a 100 percent clean uh, and zero emission project and then we are providing all the package so buses charging infrastructure, uh, services related to the management of the bus, the infrastructure, energy, whatever is, uh, has been uh, uh, requested by the tender in Santiago de Chile in, as a service business model. So we are being repaid um, with a fixed, in, the, in that case, with a fixed uh, monthly installment uh, that repays the, the investment and all the services. 
but uh, in a uh, um, future opportunities, so for example, in Colombia, and we will see an example in the, in the, in the next slide, uh, we have been also um, set up a specific uh, uh, business model uh, that uh, um, allows the public transport authorities and the, um, and, and the government to pay um, for kilometers, for example. This is, a, as I mentioned, an example of what happened in, uh, in, Col in Bogota, in Colombia. We recently been awarded uh, uh, the uh, supply of 401 electric bus uh, and the construction of two brand new electro terminals uh, to uh, park and uh, charge these uh, electric bus. We joined forces with the public transport operator to bid uh, in a new concession, a new public transport concession tender. In which we took, we take, uh, we are taking care of all the assets, uh, so buses, uh, again terminals, uh, energy, uh, digital platforms uh, to manage uh, charging processes and vehicles, and so on and so forth. The public transport operator takes care of uh, its core business, so the public transport services, the um, uh, ordinary maintenance, the personnel, so the, the drivers uh, to to run the services. And uh, together we uh, were able, uh, I mean, to overcome uh, uh, competition, for example, of uh, LNG uh, technologies, because we provided uh, a much more competitive uh, total cost of ownership, again, along uh, the um, lifetime of the, of the concession. So this is, I think, uh, a very interesting uh, business model uh, that, uh, um, uh, it, it's basically now the status quo in, uh, in Latin America, and thanks to that, uh, um, the, the majority of the largest city, the metropolis over there, are using this business model to electrify the fleet and uh, uh, try to, uh, again, meet uh, the very challenging uh, um, um, target. For example, Chilean government has set up uh, an ambitious target to have 100% of electric bus uh, by 2040, uh, that is a pretty, a pretty challenging uh, uh, objective and target, uh, confirmed also uh, by the recent uh, uh, new government uh, uh, from the partisan, from, from another party. So it's uh, confirmation that this is a, a target that uh, uh, the Chilean government wants to achieve. Um, and then we are also seeing that this kind of approach uh, has been uh, um, put in place also in a recent tender uh, uh, across Europe, uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, and we believe that uh, this is uh, again a very um, helpful and uh, powerful uh, tool that uh, uh, public transport authority and government uh, have uh, in order to accelerate the transition uh, uh, to electric mobility, in that specific case, public transport electrification. Last but not least, uh, uh, the last slide, uh, sorry, that is just uh, an overall of uh, our experience in terms of uh, electric bus uh, globally. So upside China, NLX has uh, um, pretty recognized leadership uh, in the electrification of buses. So we served uh, more or less uh, 1,500 electric buses around the world, most of them, as I said, in Latin America, but we have operation also in Spain and uh, in uh, um, United States. Uh, 19 electro terminals, uh, um, half of them uh, built up from scratch. So brand new electro terminals uh, dedicated to electric buses. Uh, and you can see also at the uh, in the center of the um, of this slide uh, um, that we are, uh, as, as I mentioned, also working on uh, integrating uh, smart mobility, uh, smart city services. So, for example, in uh, in the first uh, uh, together with the first uh, wave of electric bus in Santiago de Chile, we have also renewed uh, forty uh, bus shelter and bus stop uh, across Santiago de Chile. Uh, with the uh, um, uh, bus stop station that integrates uh, video surveillance, uh, integrates digital ticketing costs, um, um, solar panel on top of that, uh, uh, LED lighting, so services that are also that are from one side functional to the public transport services, on the other side improve the um, um, control uh, of the of the territory from the um, uh, local government uh, and improve also safety and, and security for the for the passengers. 
So this was my last slide. So open to any kind of uh, question, curiosity you might have. Thank you, Giovanni and everybody. Thank you, Valerio. Uh, yes, we can move on the question uh, time. Uh, we have uh, some uh, some questions from the public. Uh, one is for here, Valerio. So um, does digitalization provide benefits also in a transition to electric fleet? And if so, how? Absolutely. Then, thanks, Giovanni. This is a, a very, a very um, uh, interesting uh, uh, question because, uh, I mean, on top of uh, uh, renewing as asset and hardware, so replacing vehicle, uh, installing a charging station, I mean, could be uh, a waste of time and a waste of money if you can, if you are not integrating and managing this asset. Uh, through digital platform. Why digital? Uh, because uh, clearly digitalization allows to have uh, real-time information. So you can have in real time, you can know in real time what is happening along the streets uh, uh, with your asset, uh, and then you can properly adapt uh, either, for example, the scheduling of your buses, but also the recharging processes at the, at the depot in order to um, guarantee the high, uh, highest quality uh, of service as possible. And at the same time, uh, maximize the uh, energy savings that translates in uh, a reduction of cost. So you can uh, really uh, improve uh, uh, the uh, effectiveness uh, of your service, um, basically spending less. But uh, you cannot do uh, uh, differently if not with the digital platform. Thank you, Valerio. I have a, we have another question to Stefan. Uh, what could what could uh, suitable me measures be for accelerating the carbonization of transport in northern Africa? Yeah, there were uh, a number of um, subsidies identified that uh, could, uh, you know, take hold uh, for uh, when buying the cars and establishing the charging infrastructure. Uh, import exceptions, uh, exemptions, and um, then, uh, but uh, very tangibly, let me say, there could be, um, you know, subsidies also or um, fostering of uh, sharing services that I uh, uh, lined out. And uh, I uh, agree with uh, Valerio that uh, fleets can be more easily managed. So establishing, say, fleets uh, of electric cars or electric mopeds or e-bikes, that's going to be very useful. And um, then also, yeah, public charging. Um, and um, uh, also, there's actually in uh, Morocco already a plan for further electri electrifying the, the train, the rail network, and also for um, development of uh, domestic hydrogen. And uh, so, all these together uh, will make a, a huge step forward. Let me mention one more thing, and that was also briefly um, uh, mentioned at the, at the very beginning. I think it's really important that skills are being built up because uh, for uh, maintaining and uh, you know managing uh, electric cars and uh, the charging infrastructure, it does require specific skills and training. So that don't, let's not forget about that. And that's the job creation part, and, and it needs to be started uh, very, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, there is one, one, uh, the last one uh, to the sum. Uh, how can North Africa overcome the lack of uh, charging infrastructure? Could you repeat it once more? Sorry, Giovanni, I couldn't hear you well. Yes. How can North Africa overcome the lack of charging infrastructure? Well, I believe peer-to-peer -peer platform would be ideal. The whole issue is that if you look to a charging station, a DC charging station, it has a price between 25,000 euros, I'd say, or and above. And then when we look into it as an investment uh, being put from the private sector with still no tariff or regulations that would guarantee bring the money back. 
And even if there is a tariff or regulations that would guarantee bringing the money back, this would make uh, more or less electric vehicle charging way more expensive compared to internal combustion engines. Because we are speaking about 500 vehicles in some countries, I was speaking Egypt in this case, and doing the calculation just to serve 500 electric vehicles is challenging. That's why we are always faced with this kind of chicken egg problem, what should come first? I believe the intermediate solutions would come through this peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer charging platforms, which means people should be allowed to charge anywhere and everywhere, even without charging infrastructure in the meantime, which means any socket hole should serve the job. However, we have to think about a way to make it available. And I believe peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks would be the most ideal solution just to start and ignite the market till we have more or less well-established infrastructure in the beginning. That would be my answer. Thank you, Hassan. Um, yes, uh, at this point, uh, I can uh, leave the floor to Dino for final uh, salutations and Ilaria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, and, and thanks to the, the distinguished uh, guests that, that were with, with us, uh, especially from uh, ABB, Shenzhen Idea, and uh, EFRI, Nexus, and finally NLX. Uh, it was really, really inter interesting. I think that, that this is a starting point for us, uh, hoping that uh, in each country uh, they can create uh, a structure like uh, Motose in order to, uh, uh, to, to spread the, the, the advocacy and, and also the lobbying through, through their, their activity to the uh, uh, political decisors. Um, it's, it's very important because if we think that in Morocco there is the production of the Citroën EMI and they sell and they uh, uh, deliver these products to, uh, to, to the other country, like in France or, uh, or in Italy, I think that we will have a lot of room, a lot of space to go ahead. So I hope that uh, this uh, co cooperation with the rest of our Africa will, uh, we will continue in the next uh, future and uh, also with involving of uh, automotive industry, of course, because uh, today the, the big lack was the, uh, the uh, automotive industry because we were not able to connect uh, in the right, right time on this, but the next time they will be with us. Okay, thank you. so thank, thank you very much. I, I leave my, my, my floor to uh, Ilaria for the, her final remarks. Thank you very much, Dino. Thank you, Giovanni, for moderating the, this webinar. I can only confirm what Dino said. This is a starting point, uh, in particular for Rest for Africa, regarding the electric mobility in North Africa. So we will do our best to contain this, uh, this topic, investigate this topic. Uh, and I think also that for all the participants, the, the event has been uh, fruitful. So thank you very much uh, for the participation. Uh, and. I don't know if also Roberto would add something, otherwise we, we can also close here. Okay, maybe maybe we, we can close. He has some problem of connection. So thank you very much uh, to everyone to, for joining and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. Bye, thanks. Bye.